Gracias, que va para mí. Uh, so, welcome everyone to the second day of our workshop, Optical Microscopy at CoLife and Friends, Learning the Basics. So, today we have again uh, three talks and we start uh, with Pedro Pereira from the head of uh, Microscopy Facility at ITKB. Uh, and he will tell us about super resolution flavors at CoLife. Thank you, Mariana. Let me share my screen. Okay, so welcome to the second day of optical microscopy at CoLife. And uh, today I want to give you exactly like the title suggests, a notion of the super resolution flavors you can find at CoLife. <clears throat> I will uh, take this opportunity to give you uh, an introduction about the major uh, super resolution techniques available, or at least the ones that uh, resulted in a Nobel Prize. Um, and I hope this is useful not only because I know a lot of people are from outside of CoLife, I hope this is useful for all for other users. Okay, so. Um, you all know this slide because even if you haven't seen it, it's kind of obvious. Uh, biology has different sizes, has a wide range of scales. And you can go from small organisms to really, really tiny molecules. And uh, usually when you want to see interactions between some of these players, uh, despite the fact that you can use several techniques, microscopy tends to be uh, the technique of choice because you can actually see the interaction. Obviously, in this context, you can use electron microscopy, which basically covers the whole playing field, is extremely powerful, but uh, it has some disadvantages regarding, uh, for example, fluorescent microscopy. Uh, namely, you cannot do live cell imaging, which is probably the major advantage of fluorescent microscopy, and molecular specific labeling, it's hard in electron microscopy, whereas in fluorescent microscopy, it's extremely easy. 
Obviously, you might have noticed that fluorescent microscopy is restricted to this point here. And uh, this is what we call the diffraction limit. So what is the diffraction limit? You, might, you all have seen, because you are alive in, uh, in the world, you all have seen light go through um, a whole, let's say, a window, a door, and usually you don't see anything funny. You just see sunlight coming through your window and illuminates your living room, for example. However, let's now imagine that uh, your door or your window is extremely small. Tiny, 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 tiny window. Uh, one could uh, think that, okay, if I reduce the size of this hole, I'll just have less light going through. So it will be a straight line going through. But in reality, that's not what happens. What happens is if you have a, a small enough hole, light expands. And because of interference, all this, the, the, the light that's going through here functions as a, its own point source of light and it radiates in all directions. And you can imagine it has a lot of uh, problems for microscopy. But before we get into that, let me prove you that this is indeed the case. What I'm going to show you now is a movie of a classical experiment that shows the diffraction limit. And it's uh, done by Ricardo Henriques, now a PI at IGC and my former boss, um, which basically what I'm going to show you is two slits. Uh, so slits are these metal things here, and this is a laser. And I'm going to close the slits, or Ricardo closed the slits, better said. And one might imagine that actually when you close them, the laser, so this is the laser in a wall behind, so you might imagine that the laser would just get smaller because you're closing it. But in reality, that's not what you see. What you see is not only doesn't it not get smaller, but it gets bigger. And it gets bigger and you start seeing the interference patterns that you heard about uh, Tuesday um, that uh, characterize the PSF, okay? Okay, so what does this mean in terms of microscopy? This means that if you now have a point source of light, could be a GFP, and it goes through a really tiny hole, it expands on the other side. And you might have already guessed that this tiny hole is an objective. So you cannot really escape the diffraction limit. And this is the first take home message. You cannot, it's a physical law. You cannot escape it. You cannot break it. You can fool it though. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so very quickly, Diffraction limits. Davide went through this, so I'm going to go fast through this this uh, this part, but I just want to to give you a quick refresher. So imagine that you have GFA molecule, which is 2.5 nanometers in size. If there was no diffraction limit, and in reality, if you could see it uh, with a naked eye, you would see a point source of light that was 2.5 nanometers in size. However, in order to see this this GFP, you need an objective which means that it will interact with the components of the objective and it will come out on the other side has this area disk pattern, this diffraction limited spot, which is roughly to 250 nanometers, okay? And you heard about how we defined uh, resolution. I'm not going to delve into this, but you know that it's the numerical aperture and the wavelength that are relevant. And you usually don't see this in your camera. You see this that's due to the pixelated uh, view of your PSF that you have in a microscope. Okay, so what does this mean means in biology? So how does this translate into a cell, for example? So let's imagine that we have uh, eight molecules and they're all spaced uh, at a distance that's higher than the diffraction limit. You can easily say that there are eight molecules and you can say this is a square, okay? However, this uh, usually does not happen in real life. You never have eight molecules nicely spaced at a distance greater than the diffraction limit. Uh, what usually happens, it's they are packed in a distance that's smaller than this 300 nanometer diffraction limit. So when this happens, you lose all the information. You do not know how many molecules there are anymore, and you do not know uh, what's their shape or their organization. Okay, so this is why the diffraction limit is such an important thing uh, in biology. And going back to our size scales, there's a lot of cool stuff happening below the diffraction limit. 
And again, you could use electron microscopy, but if you want to see the dynamic information of these processes or use a wealth of um, molecular specific labeling tools, you need basically fluorescent microscopy. So this is how super resolution came to be. It's basically an extension of fluorescent microscopy that basically brings the, um, the limit down to the single nanometer level, okay? So there are many, many, many different options. And this is just a few because there are many more, but I want to focus on the, like I told you in the beginning, on the three main ones um, that resulted in the Nobel Prize. Okay, so starting with probably the most common one and the most heavily used, which is structural illumination microscopy. So I will start uh, telling you about structural illumination, talking about music. So this is a chord, and you all know that the chord is, uh, for example, in a piano, is where you play more than one key, okay? You can play two, three, four, whatever you want. And it's a complex uh, sound. But you also know that this chord can be divided into a simpler and uh, probably uh, easier to digest single notes, right? So this chord is composed by the single notes. And you also know that music can be seen in different ways. You can have it like in this shape, uh, you can hear it, but you can also visualize it because it's, uh, you can see it has a frequency. So, and you have this uh, chord, which is this very complex frequency, but you can also deconstruct this chord into its individual notes. And the same is true for its frequency. So this is kind of obvious, but this is uh, basically the fundamental concept of structural illumination. All complex signals are a sum of simple, pure frequencies. And another important concept is you can very easily go from this very complex signal to this very simple, uh, pure frequencies doing a mathematical transformation, which is called the Fourier transform, which you might have heard when um, you're talking about SIM. Okay, so now you might ask, why are you talking about this? What does this have to do with imaging? So when you look at an image, you can see, oops, okay. I had an animation here, but you see all at the same time, no worries. When you see in an image and you measure specific features in an image, you can see, for example, in this case, a cell where microtubules are labeled, you can measure the distances between the microtubules. And this sort of looks like the frequency I was showing you in the music, right? So you have ones that are further apart, so coarse details, and others that are very close together, more fine details. And obviously, you can do the same transformation that we did for the music. So we have this image, and now I do the Fourier transform, and I have this. And this is basically the same thing. They're the same image, but here you, I'm showing you uh, this information in a specific way. And here I'm showing the same information in a different way, okay? So where are these uh, uh, features encoded in this new uh, Fourier transform that I just showed you? Okay, so if you have really coarse details, so low resolution, they're here in the middle. If you have intermediate details, they're here more or less uh, in the intermediate part of this uh, Fourier transform. High level, high resolution details, they're more to the edge. And this is your resolution limit, right in the edge. And one thing, one thing, if you're not really grasping this concept, one thing you can do is uh, to understand really what are coarse details and uh, fine details is get a photograph of yourself, open it in Fiji, and then do a Fourier transform of your photograph. So you will see that your face becomes something like this. And then you can basically delete parts of this image. So for example, you can delete the center bit where you delete all the coarse details, or you can delete this edge bit where you delete all the fine details. And then you do the inverse Fourier transform of your image and you see how your photograph either loses uh, a coarse detail, like for example, the shape, you, the shape of your face starts getting weird and you just see all the tiny details of your hair, for example, 
or vice versa. It's a very good way to understand this, but I digress. So, okay, I've showed you that you can show this original image in a different way, but I haven't shown you how you can extract further information. And to do that, we, in structural illumination, what it's used is a very simple concept, which is interference patterns. And you all have seen it in Moiré pattern. Moiré patterns are when two grids uh, are misaligned, they interact constructively and destructively with each other to give rise to a new pattern. And you've seen it often, you're probably seeing a different Moiré pattern that I'm seeing in your computer because of the grid, the, the pixels of your screen. But you've seen it in nature many times when basically you take a photo of something that has a, a very specific pattern. Uh, let me show you how this works. So here you have two concentric, uh, two rings with concentric rings. And what I'll do is superimpose them. And you'll see that uh, when this uh, structure interacts with this structure, you extract more information. So here it is. So as you can see, there's a bunch of new information appearing just by superimposing these two grids, okay? And importantly, if I go back, you see that the information that's here is very, very, very fine. You almost cannot see the concentric rings, right? In both of them. But when I superimpose them, all the information that you're extracting or a lot of it is much coarse. It's much easier to see, okay? So it's, this is exactly the concept uh, microscope or the people that invented SIM, Gustafsson, and the microscope is doing when you're acquiring a SIM image. You have your wide field image and your Fourier transform. And what you do is you superimpose a grid that's in your microscope to another grid, which is your sample. And by doing that, you get uh, a resulting image which has these uh, more fringes that where you can extract more information, okay? And by doing that, you introduce new frequencies into your resulting image, which you can then transform into high resolution information, okay? So it's a very simple concept. And it also explains if you want to, to, to understand uh, the images you acquire when you, when you do SIM, it also explains why you have beautiful same image, for example, with microtubules, and you have very bad same image when you're using, for example, DNA, because the, it all relies on the interference between two grids, right? So if you have linear information in your image, it's a much stronger interaction than if you have an amorphous structure in your image, okay? So, structural illumination. Importantly, it's a wide field technique. It's uh, why, this is basically why should you use it? It works with any fluorophore. It's very easy to use. It has very good temporal resolution. It's much less phototoxic than single molecular stats, for example. And you have a two to two fold increase in spatial resolution. And you might say, eh, two fold increase is not much. Yes, but it's enough, for example, to see the inner uh, organization of a virus, if the virus has the right size. So. Do not get uh, hung on the, how, the increase in spatial resolution. Think about your biological problem. What is it that you want to see? And uh, what's the technique you, you need to employ? Okay, so now moving on to confocal super resolution. I'm going to tell you just a tiny bit about STED because despite the fact that we don't have STED available in CoLife, uh, PPBI does have a STED. Uh, there you can access a STED microscope in the context of PPBI. And it's a very powerful technique, so it's useful uh, to be aware of it. Okay, so Rino explained this very well. I don't need to lose a lot of time here. But uh, confocal microscopy, it's very simple. You have your fluorophores in a sample. You beam, you scan the sample with your beam. You have a pinhole to avoid all autofocus light and you have a confocal image, yeah? Very simple. You have the big advantage of having optical sectioning and um, actually it's a bit less phototoxic than uh, other techniques. So how is that different? It's not really. The, the only difference is that rather than have one laser scanning your sample, you have two. And in this case, one laser excites your fluorophores 
and the other the excited them. We can, if you're curious about how this uh, works, you can ask me in the end, I'm more than happy to discuss it. But basically, it's very simple. Imagine you have your label structure, and if you're doing confocal, you have your excitation beam, and you get your detected fluorescence, easy. If you're doing STAT, however, you have the same label structure, the same excitation beam, but now you have a donut beam on top. And basically, the STAT beam prevents fluorescence all, in all of this yellow area here and only allows fluorescence in this tiny blue area here. So what this means is that in reality, the detected fluorescence is no longer uh, 250 nanometers, it's now 50 or 10 or whatever, it depends on how strong this stead beam is, stead beam is. So how does this work? Exactly in the same way as a confocal works. You have the same uh, more or less system. Actually, you can, uh, stead microscopes are not very different from a, a confocal microscope, apart from the fact that they have other lasers. And you beam, you scan your sample normally. And in the end, you have a final image with increased resolution. An important thing, and why I'm mentioning STED, is STED is the only optical super resolution technique, truly optical super resolution technique available. You have what you see is what you get. So there's no reconstruction, uh, there's no um, processing of the image. You get, you put the two lasers and you scan your sample and in the end you have a super resolution image. All the other techniques require some sort of reconstruction. Obviously, has a confocal technique and also deconvolve your image, but you don't need to. So it's the only true instant super resolution technique. Okay. Just to give you a notion of how this works uh, and how tunable this uh, resolution is. So the higher the stat power, stat beam power you use, the smaller the hole, right, of your donut. So what this means is that the more power you put the higher resolution you get. And you might say, wow, this is the perfect technique. It really is very powerful. But um, you have to consider that you are putting a lot of power into your sample. Uh, for example, STEV can give you, it's used, for example, to give you the crystal structure of diamonds. But the amount of energy you have to put to see the crystal structure of a diamond would basically fry any biological sample you might, you might uh, want to put. Okay, so, whoops, this is not structural illumination, obviously, it's STEV, sorry for that. So, STEV is a confocal technique. Uh, it needs specialized fluorophores because, and we can delve into that in the questions, because the, um, let me put the video playing, because to, to play with this um, stimulation uh, emission, you have to have a specific type of fluorophores, can have very good temporal resolution but it can also be very phototoxic. Um, it does not require any computational reconstruction and it has this tunable spatial resolution, but again, it comes at a price. So be aware of that. Okay, much uh, more common than uh, STEV is Ariscan Confocal and that we do have in the concepts of, of CoLife. And it's, again, it's basically the same as Confocal it's a, you just go to your normal confocal and you have an area scan detector. So how is this different? So whereas in the confocal, you have your focal plane and your nice pinhole and your detector. In your area scan, you don't. You have your focal plane, obviously, but then you don't have this pinhole. What you do have is a series, an array of detectors, 32 actually, that basically detect the fluorescent that com comes from your sample from slightly different angles and uses that information to reconstruct a high resolution image, okay? So as a definition, you would say that it function has a series of small air units, pinholes, that provides an optical, an increase in optical resolution and in contrast. But if you want to understand the scan confocal, you, it's very simple. It's basically you give compound eyes to your confocal, okay? So this is basically it. You just give it many, many AIs that see the same thing from different perspectives and use all of that information to reconstruct um, a high resolution image. And again, 
I forgot to change the tile though. Sorry for that. I think this might happen a lot in the in a few slides, but it doesn't matter. So we're talking about Terry scan here. Again, confocal technique. Uh, any fluorophore can be used. Very good temporal resolution, not very phototoxic, and it's and it's again very easy to use. So you have a 1.7 increase in spatial resolution, but don't forget, it's not the full increase in spatial resolution that you should focus on. Is what is it that you want to see in your image? Okay. So now let me tell you a bit about single molecules. Single molecules probably the oldest and the most well-established uh, super resolution technique available. Also because the systems, the microsubs themselves are cheap and easy to build uh, and easy to use. <clears throat> How does this work? So as the name suggests, you need to, to, you need single molecules, right? So let's imagine you have this structure, this wide field uh, structure, which could be a mitochondria. And all its internal um, structure is hidden within the diffraction limit. In single molecule, in uh, the family of techniques called single molecule, what you do is somehow you switch off all of these fluorophores here, and then you turn on um, a sparse and specific subset of fluorophores that if they're spaced more than the diffraction limit, you can very precisely and accurately detect their center, okay? And you do this across many, 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 many image. And in each image, you always have a different subset of fluorophores, uh, which are all spatially spaced. And you can very easily detect and localize them. And by doing so, you can reconstruct a super resolution image, OK? So you might say, well, that's confusing. But it's not. It's, it's very simple to understand. Usually, I do this with an audience, which is easier, but um, today I'm going to do this slightly differently. So let's imagine I have a musical instrument, and you don't know which musical instrument I have in my hand, okay? You don't know how many notes I'm going to play. So if I play all the notes at the same time, you hear a sound, right? But you still cannot tell me how many notes I can play, okay? So this is your wide field image, like this. One frame, all the information at the same time. However, if I now play one note at a time, you know exactly, ah, so it's an ukulele. It has four notes. So that's the idea with single molecule. You trade a temporal resolution for spatial resolution, OK? So Instead of playing all the four notes at the same time, I play one at a time, which means I take longer, but you have more resolution because you can hear and distinguishing them uh, in time. Okay, in this case, it would be auditive, uh, auditive resolution, not spatial, but still. Okay, so <clears throat> this family of techniques, which uh, apart from surf works more or less all in the same way and has can have different names. Can have Palm, Storm, DNA Pain. And the difference between these three is just the, the probes they use. Palm is, uh, uses fluorescent proteins, Storm using, uses organic dye molecules, and DNA Paint uses organic dye molecules in combination with DNA. If you're curious about any of these, please just ask me in the end. I'm not going to explain in detail any of them. SURF, which also uh, falls within this family, is, uh, works in a different way. But uh, I added it here because it's a very useful tool. I was part of the development, and it's a very useful tool, uh, as I will show in the end. <clears throat> OK, but let's forget about SURF for a minute now. So. These single molecule techniques that rely on this uh, trade-off between temporal and spatial resolution, how do they work? So as I showed you, what we do is instead of having all of the fluorophores uh, on at the same time, we have a sparse subset. And if indeed we have a sparse subset of fluorophores, we can detect them. And we can basically say, ah, this is the center. So here it is. This is the, the most likely position of uh, this uh, protein, for example. 
And although you could do this by hand, detect each spot and fit a Gaussian to it, it's much easier to use a computer, right? So that's what we do. We have loads of different reconstructed algorithms, which are basically all doing the same thing. Detect uh, fluorescence over background and finding the center of this fluorescence by fitting a Gaussian to it, okay? Very easy. So easy that you can actually use this for anything, okay? It does not have to be a biological sample. <clears throat> the concept is sound for any blinking uh, movie. And for this, I want to steal a movie from Ricard uh, that he took in Paris, which is the Eiffel Tower blinking. So as you can see, this is a macro structure, which is blinking. Obviously, if, you, if what I've been telling you is true, um, I lost my mouse, whoops, spoiler. Uh, if I've been telling you it through, if I apply the same concept um, that I just showed you to this movie, I will be able to get a reconstruction of this, of this uh, movie. And indeed I can. So if I just focus on the different blinking molecules that are showing up in this movie, I can see the original, the particle detection, and the reconstruction. And this way have a super resolved image of the Eiffel Tower, okay? Obviously, we tend not to use this for Eiffel Towers or other macromolecules. We tend to use this for biological sample. And the big advantage of STORM is that because it gives you such, or single molecule in this case, it gives you such a high resolution that you can actually zoom in, zoom in, and zoom in until you see huge amounts of detail. For example, this is dark clathrine coated pits or here a microtubule. And each of these dots is a detection that you have in your original movie, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so why would you use single molecule? It's a wide field technique. It's, uh, it's, it needs specialized fluorophores, which makes it uh, difficult to do multicolor imaging, although it is possible. And if you use, for example, DNA paint, you can do roughly infinite colors. Uh, when I say infinite, it's, you're only limited by sample prep. You're not limited by um, spectral uh, differences. Because it's, uh, it's low, so it has poor temporal resolution. Obviously, it can be phototoxic and require toxic buffers. Um, but it can give you a tenfold increase in spatial resolution or actually more. Okay, so I've showed you three super resolution techniques, uh, same uh, step and single molecule, uh, every scan also, but basically uh, all of them require a specific microscope or um, specific fluorophores, one or the other. So basically they are expensive or they require you to have a specific uh, kit that you might not have available to you in your lab. So how can we overcome this? Uh, and another issue, is that, for example, probably the easiest one, which is single molecule, is not very life cell compatible uh, due to how slow it is and uh, the need for very specific sample prep uh, conditions. So we have two issues. You might not have access to these sorts of microscopes and you might really want to do uh, life cell imaging uh, and have life cell super resolution imaging, right? And, or even worse, you might want both you have no microscope available to you, and they, you, what you really want is life cell imaging. Fear not, I will give you solutions. So going now is where SURF comes into play. So as I told you, single molecule is not uh, very life cell compatible. This is because whereas wide field imaging, classical wide field imaging requires low illumination in short acquisitions, and it's very fast, single molecule, requires intense illuminations. Um, I didn't show you why, but um, we can talk about this, but basically this is how you can get to switch off all of your fluorophores in a sample and requires long acquisitions because as I told you, you're trading spatial resolution, uh, sorry, temporal resolution for spatial resolution. Okay, so this is an issue, right? So if we go back to our scheme that I showed you, so what are the problems here? Okay, 
you need special probes, you need uh, high intensity uh, illumination, you might need redox buffer that takes loads of time, and you need this detection and localization algorithm. There's a bunch of constraints you have. Um, but if you wanted to make this more life self friendly, I guess the most obvious one would be that you would basically reduce the laser illumination, right? Try to make it a bit more uh, life cell friendly. And just to give you a notion on how life cell unfriendly these sort of techniques are, it's like giving a third degree burn to your cells, uh, at least, probably much more than that. So what happens? Here what you have is the same data set where we reduced the laser power, okay? And because we reduced the laser power, we go from a nice sparse single molecule acquisition to uh, basically a wide field image um, where everything is happening at the same time. Obviously, if you use classical reconstruction algorithms, uh, if you have nice single molecule data, you have nice single molecule results. However, if you use more wide field like image, you lose lots of information. And here, let me make a small uh, stop just to highlight this. This is probably critical and the most important thing you have to know uh, when you're thinking about using a super resolution technique. Apart from STED, all super resolution techniques, you are not seeing your raw data. You are seeing a transformation of your raw data. So when you have a result, you cannot ever take it at face value. Because for example, if you would take this result at face value, you, you would say that here, there's nothing, right? There's no microtubules in this area. And in reality, what you have is exactly the opposite. It's full of information, okay? And this is true for single molecule, but it's also true for other uh, uh, techniques which uh, entail a reconstruction, okay? You have to always be careful and look at the raw data to be sure that what you're seeing is not an artifact. Okay, this is my, my um, message, my take home message that uh, interrupted the flow of the talk. <laughs> so going back to what I was saying, we have your raw acquisition and your reconstruction full of artifacts. So if you, instead of using your classical uh, super resolution reconstruction alg algorithms, use SERP, and I'm not going to explain how SURF works because I have no time for that. But if you're curious, you can just ask me. You have a really, really positive outcome, which is you have a beautiful reconstruction regardless of the laser power you put in and uh, of the conditions you use. So if you have the perfect uh, single molecule uh, acquisition, you have the perfect reconstruction. If you have an intermediate single molecule raw data, you have an intermediate quality, intermediate resolution reconstruction. And if you have a wide field like raw data, you have also a resolution, a super resolution result, but with less resolution than the first one. So very, very similar to STED, you can tune the resolution you, you get by playing with the amount of light you put into your sample, okay? So, you always get the super resolution image and you always get an increase in resolution, but you get um, an increase that depends on the amount of power you use. Okay, so other advantages. It works with both wide field and confocal microscopes. So we broke that separation. Uh, you can use this in confocal data or in wide field data. It works with any fluorophore. For example, what you're seeing here on the right is GFP, but it also works with organic dyes. It has very good temporal resolution. It's not very phototoxic. And this links with working with both wide field and confocal. It works on any uh, modern system. Just to give you a notion, this movie that you have here on the right is continuous imaging of um, uh, GFP tagged actin, actually eutrophin, but what you're seeing is actin. Um, in imaged constantly, nonstop for half an hour in a LED white field. And this is the white field and this is the super resolution result. So in reality, when I say you can use this in any microscope, you can literally use it in any microscope. And again, if you want to use it, you just download it from Fiji and use it it's free to use, open source and so forth. Okay, so, what if 
like I was telling you, you really, because with SURF, you don't have the microscope and you want to do lifestyle imaging. Okay, you can use SURF. But now you have an, a different issue. You don't have the super resolution microscope, but you want to have a really uh, high spatial resolution, like tenfold increase in spatial resolution. You want storm, but you don't have a storm microscope. For that, you have expansion microscopy. Again, it's a technique, a very recent technique that does not require any special kits or any special microscope, and it's all based on diapers. So it's a very elegant solution to, to super resolution. And basically it's based on a compound that's inside diapers, which is sodium acrylate. Sodium acrylate is a compound that absorbs water very efficiently, as you might imagine, because it's in diapers. And you can basically embed your sample into a gel, which has this, this uh, compound and expand it, okay? So how does this work? Let's imagine you have your sample here. This is a cell. You have all the details of your cell, the nuclei, the whatever thing I drew, I don't know. And you want to expand it, right? You want to do super resolution. So as I blow into this glove, it's the same thing as you do with expansion microscopy, okay? So now you have the same cell, but much bigger, right? And you can see that all, you can see much better all the details inside the cell, okay? And importantly, you also see that the, the labels are a bit dimmer, which is due to the physical expansion of your sample, which also happens, curiously enough, in the actual expansion microscopy, okay? So how does this work? We have many, many different techniques. Uh, you have XM, uh, pro-XM, you have XM with fish, with tissues, uh, with cells. Uh, basically, you can do expansion microscopy with whatever you, you think of. You can do it um, with uh, fluorescent proteins, uh, with uh, antibodies, with whatever. And there's more and more papers coming out every day on this technique. So actually, there's, uh, there's a wealth of information available. And if you want to actually start uh, exploring expansion microscopy, you can always talk to us. Then we'll be able to, to guide you through all the available options. So it's a very simple, the, the concept. It's you embed your sample into a structure and then you expand that structure, okay? You might think, hmm, that, that I find that uh, difficult to, to grasp because I might be introducing artifacts and you're absolutely right, you can. So how can you minimize that possibility? So the idea is that <clears throat> you stain your cell. Uh, you can also do it the staining after, but uh, for this specific purpose, let's imagine that you stain it before, you stain your cell, uh, you link your cell to a gel, and this linkage is done very simply by using um, an 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 a acrylamide monomer with an enantious ester uh, moiety. So basically what you're doing is you're decorating all of your primary amine in your cell with acrylamide, okay? Uh, this is important because, as you might know, membranes do not have primary amine. So if you want to see membranes, you'll have to use different tricks, which are now also available. So you decorate your sample with acrylamide, and then basically what you do is you polymerize an acrylamide gel on top, like you would do for an SDS page, but in this case, uh, you do it on top of your sample. Then you digest your sample, uh, in order for it not to mechanically resist the expansion. And when I say mechanically resist is, for example, you have to digest it, uh, your protein structure or your, your uh, polymeric structure that might be surrounding your sample. So if you're talking about uh, a cell, you have to use, for example, protein SK to digest all the protein structure so that when you expand it, the proteins do not offer resistance, okay? And to expand, what you do basically is put that gel in water. So 
it will the gel will grow and because you digested partially your sample your sample will grow with the gel and if you've done this properly the growth will be perfectly uh, uh, isotropic so you will expand your sample in x y z without any artifact this is just an example of what you could see pre and post expansion if you're curious about this there's many papers obviously but there's also this uh, expansion microscopy.org where there's loads of protocols and these are from the Biden lab the developers of this technique uh, one of the developers of this technique and they have a wealth of information and if you want to see another example you can see a youtube video i have of me uh, doing the protocol um, which might also help you uh, to get started and you can also make me see me make a full out of myself which is also interesting okay so here you see fourfold fourfold expansion you can expand your sample four times but in reality uh, there are many available techniques now and now you can actually expand tenfold uh, your sample and this tenfold increase in resolution is the limit why because when you reach this 25 nanometer resolution uh, even a bit further than that you start to see the artifacts due to primary and secondary antibody labeling and the problems of your uh, actual staining of your sample which is also another another interesting thing to have in mind <clears throat> because you should be aware that you're never seeing your sample or your target of interest what you're seeing in a microscope is the fluorophore or the pro that's with which you tagged your target of interest okay so when you think ah i want a hundredfold increase in resolution that makes no sense because if you have a hundredfold increase in resolution you're now seeing the antibodies you're not seeing your target of interest anymore right so the error starts to becoming so big that the biology loses logic okay so again expansion microscopy allows to go from non-expanded to tenfold expansion without any special kit or any special microscopes and it's quite easy to do to be totally honest okay so what you have it works with both wide field and confocal just like surf actually you can mix them together you can use you can use a super an expansion microscopy sample in a super resolution mi microscope to give you even more resolution so you can mix them all together and play as much as you want uh, works with almost any fluorophore. I say almost because, for example, cyanide dyes get destroyed. So Alexa 647, Cy5, Cy3 get destroyed uh, during the process. But apart from that, it works very well. And if you go to the original papers, there's lists of dyes um, and how well they, they withstand the treatment. Obviously, it has very bad temporal resolution because you cannot do this in live cell. Uh, it works uh, when any modern system, and again, also has tunable special resolution because you can choose which technique to use, okay? So this I'll finish here. Just let me uh, leave you with uh, some food for thought and some conclusions. So I've been, I mentioned a few of these throughout the talk, but there's something when you're doing super resolution decide i want to do super resolution i really want to i love super resolution i really need it is the my dream and so forth you have to think that uh it's a hell of a lot of work to get a true meaningful result okay despite the fact that they're getting easier and easier you still have to think about what you're doing so one thing that uh, you should be aware is these advisors here and that it's not as easy as get your normal sample preparation from a confocal or a diffraction limit white field and then go to a super resolution microscope. It does not work like that. You have to be aware of what you're doing, okay? They said it's, it's, it's easy. It's not uh, uh, rocket science. Okay, I would like to thank uh, everyone for listening and before I finish I would like to give a shout out to Sean Cully my big friend uh, 
uh, with whom I worked in London, because a lot of the slides that you saw today are hers, and she has all of her presentations in Figshare available, and she does gorgeous presentations, so I don't even bother anymore. I steal from her, uh, and, uh, and that's it. So thank you, and I'm available for your questions. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I think we have a question from Dinesh. Yeah. I will allow him to talk. Dinesh. Hi, good morning. Hi, Dinesh. Hi, hi Pedro. Uh, nice presentation. I have a few, uh, few queries. Uh, like, what is the value of one every unit in nanometer or Armstrong? Uh, so, that will depend on your microscope, basically. Okay. No, you mean uh, you mentioned something with the. Yeah, but uh, it will. So it will depend. It's the area you need. You can consider like your resolution. So uh -huh. the size of VSF. So if you have, uh, for example, for a GFP, it will be roughly two hundred and fifty nanometers. Two hundred fifty nanometer. And what it about sci-fi? Right? Uh, sci uh, yeah, I would have to do the math, but it should be uh -huh. a bit larger than that. Uh, uh, okay. But uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, another just question. Use the formula that uh, David uh, gave you, and you can calculate more or less uh, how how big is your PSF. No, no problem. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I have another uh, query uh, in expansion microscopy. Uh -huh. Why uh, in digestion step we are using pro uh, proteins? So, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, so do the synaptophysin protein in neurons is affected by this digestion procedure? And how we can be sure? Is there any method so to confirm that? All, all proteins are affected by this digestion. So you use proteinase K rather than uh -huh. trypsin, for example, uh -huh. because uh -huh. proteinase K is a bit less harsh than trypsin. But uh -huh. uh, the key thing here that you should think is all proteins are digested. So antibodies are digested, fluorescent uh -huh. proteins are digested, everything is digested. But mm -hmm. the thing is different proteins have different, you use protein escape because also the beta barrel of a fluorescent protein is slightly more resistant to protein SK mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. other proteases. But mm -hmm. don't forget, this is fixed samples. So what you want ideally is to have a really nice fixation protocol mm -hmm. that once you digest with protein SK, you mm -hmm. still maintain the the relative structure conserved okay so mm -hmm. but yes for example uh, if your protein is resistant to protein sk mm -hmm. you can very easily uh, afterwards use antibodies to stain it but if your protein is not resistant to protein sk mm -hmm. um, you have to stain beforehand okay is it some data is available to check that one yes you probably oh, okay. you have loads of stuff that in urine so i'm, I'm mm -hmm. i cannot promise you that it is but you probably <laughs> there but don't forget that it doesn't matter if uh, your pro the protein you mentioned is resistant or not okay what ah. matters is that <clears throat> you mm -hmm. will label it with something what matters is that the antibody that you're using is mm -hmm. resistant to protein sk okay no the because question i am uh, worried if i do this uh, expansion microscopy to image uh, synaptophysis no, I understand. In, I understand protein, your question. Uh, in but, newer, yeah. No, I understand yeah. your question. But the thing is that okay. that's not the if your protein is resistant or not to protein SK is not mm -hmm. relevant. Okay. Because what you do is you fix your you fix your sample, you stain mm -hmm. it with antibody, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you digest it. So the antibodies are there stuck to your to your protein of interest. And that's what okay. you're imaging, okay? So, yeah. <clears throat> and if your fixation process was good enough, your mm -hmm. protein should withstand this treatment. But imagine that you don't want to digest with protein SK. There's other options. You can, for example, use it at um, heat and triton. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, or you can use, uh, you can use, for example, you can autoclave your sample. So the idea here is to have, uh, to homogenize your sample in a way in mm -hmm. a way that it does not resist expansion, okay? Okay, but while expanding, its, it's structure should, uh, while we in expansion, if we do 10x, it's making, uh, it's occupying more space. 
So you yes. need uh, so the molecules uh, distance should uh, increase. Yeah, much bigger. I, yeah. 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 So and you, one, that will be not the exact what we see at the uh, without expansion and uh, yes. So after they, the, you need controls, yeah. right? You need okay. controls. Uh -huh. But uh, the the thing, if you do this properly, you should have an internal control to see mm -hmm. something you know the distance or, st or stuff like that. There's a we have a paper on nuclear pores. How can you use nuclear pores to test? your your super resolution or your expansion microscopy protocol mm -hmm. yeah so there's Dinesh, a lot of tools ah uh, hi mariana sorry i am yeah no i will i will suggest you discuss like the the this very detail these very small details later with okay. uh, with mm. pedro but you, you can you can finish answering pedro uh, i was sorry. just saying that uh, there's different uh, techniques available and mm -hmm. uh, in reality uh, one thing that's really important to know that I didn't mention is that expansion microscopy is also a clearing method. So despite the fact that uh, things grow in size, they become water. So you do not have uh, refractive index mismatches problems anymore. So you can actually also increase uh, the information you get uh, through that uh, rut. Okay. So despite the fact that things get further apart and bigger, you mm -hmm. also have other advantages. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Pedro, can we uh, may I have a general question? Can we have the PPT of uh, all the presentation? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, Mariana. Yeah, you will get an email about that later. Is uh, that okay? Yeah, and I also uh, uh, have the. I will be happy if I can talk with the previous questions uh, to discuss with some specialist. So. I haven't got the answer. But uh, uh, Dinesh, so may I ask you where, so to which institute? Do Hi, you David. Belong? So where, maybe, where, are you, where are you located? Because who is the personal reference that maybe, to you in person? Maybe we can discuss this. Uh, yeah, we can discuss this okay. later. We have a question now from uh, Elena. I will give you the word, sorry. Elena? T, yes, sorry. Yeah, we can hear. Elena, yes, we can hear you. Ask away. Oh, sorry, did I just raise my hand? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. But, uh, by the way, great talk. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I, I I pressed the wrong button. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, nice nice ukulele <laughs> <laughs> performance <laughs> as well. And may, may I may I ask one question to Pedro? Yeah, Pedro. I don't, I'm not sure like how much experience you direct experience you have like with Stad, but mm -hmm. um, would you uh, elaborate on the difference between creating like the uh, like a virtual pinhole in excitation as the Stad does? And having a very close pinhole in detection, as um, uh, any confocal could do with like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 area units. So the, the difference of that would be the amount of because the if you close the, the pinhole, you you're basically uh, wasting the your signal, right? Like uh, Rina showed yesterday, and with the stead you're not. So and in theory, if you choose the um, a strong enough fluorophore and uh, 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 photoresistant enough fluorophore, you can then do several passages and always extract more information out of it. So it's basically the same thing, but without the compromise in intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a virtual pinhole, but you can, you can actually have a really nice signal to noise ratio which if you close the, the actual pinhole, you have a crappy signal to noise ratio. Okay, thanks. Although obviously if you're using STEV, uh, you, you need to worry about the multicolor because you need multiple uh, STEV lasers. It's, it's not cheap, but it's, it's very good. It's very good, as you know. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Miguel Siabra. Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes, yes. Any, yeah. uh, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, briefly uh, about the pros and cons of the uh, lattice light sheet microscopy. Yes. So <clears throat> lattice uh, basically has the, the cons are just that you need to get the microscope. And despite the fact that you have now commercial systems available, uh, you still need to, um, they're, they're not easy to, to use. For example, I have experience with uh, the, the 3i one, which is fantastic, but you have a lot of limitations on the, <clears throat> on the, basically you need a specialist working with the microscope at all times, okay? So this said, I haven't tried the Zeiss one, for example, which apparently is uh, much easier, but uh, you, what you get is all the advantages of uh, light sheet with a higher resolution. And with another add-on that you can, for example, if you have a bespoke system, you can actually play with it so that you can do single molecule on your lattice, like uh, Betsik did. So uh, I would say that the biggest, the biggest uh, challenge of lattice light sheet in this moment is the accessibility to the system. And uh, the system you choose to be um, robust enough for you to do many different things and not just a very specific sample. I don't know if Davide wants I, to. I would, I would like to contribute on yeah. this because I am very close to this field, guys. So the system that like, the recently uh, Zeiss uh, uh, commercialized, it's actually like a, a, a gem, like a, it's a real um, a, a gem of ingen engineerization because what they did is they solved exactly the problem that is on the user side of adapting the sample to the microscope. So the original system that Betsig made was a, an upright system and all the lattice systems that were available so far were all copying this mechanism, which is basically the straightforward way to do latex with one objective creating the sheet of light and the other one that is perpendicularly arranged for detection. Okay, so what the beauty of the engineerization of the Zeiss model is that they created an inverted system so where the two objectives come from the bottom, and then basically it's a very difficult microscope, but very easy to use. It's exactly, exactly the opposite of STORM. STORM is a very easy uh, microscope, very simple microscope, but there is a lot of preparation and knowledge that needs to go so and come from the user. So the light sheet from Zeiss, it's a very difficult, a very highly sophisticated microscope inside, that is prepared to just go with your dish and you put it on the lenses and you don't need to do anything. So you need like a Petri dish with your like a cell culture there. And usually, so the resolution is approximately, so slightly above seam resolution. So you cannot get like very high in like in resolution, but it's, uh, uh, it gives you an enormous potential for this, uh, let's say, still increased resolution, but with live cell imaging, you can see for um, um, with a really high temporal resolution, living processes for hours because you induce very little phototoxicity. And also, uh, so the system is prepared. So usually the problem, so one of the problems or limitation that the original system had was the field of view that you could have uh, and the thickness of the, of the specimen. With the new engin engineerization of Zeiss, so since the system is not upright anymore, it's inverted. So the penetration is only is given like a, the, the the limit of penetration is given by the the limit of penetration of light. So which is still single photon excitation. So you can go up to seventy microns maximum, one uh, one hundred microns, which is fantastic for this kind of technique. And regarding the field of view, they uh, also give the possibility to do tile scan with this, with this microscope. So you can still have a small field of view, but you can actually tile it to observe larger and larger areas. So it's, it's a really interesting system that we should actually test and have the possibility to, uh, to have here in Portugal uh, in, the, in the next months. So let's see whether, so Zeiss promised to, to give us a demo in, uh, in a, re a relatively uh, close time frame. And if I may add to that, if you then want to increase resolution on that, 
uh, you can use surf on top of the, the light sheet data, which when the lattice works, we've done that uh, before and it works very well. So it's quite robust. Beautiful. We are uh, candidates to use that, uh, so I'll be in touch. All right. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Very good. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much. So, Pedro, I will just leave you with the, with the comment from Humana Yanis that uh, said, a very interesting talk. Pedro, you had an amazing speaker. Everything was clear and easy to understand and fun. Uh, and thank with you. this... I will move to, to the next speaker, which is Hugo Botelho from the Faculdade de Ciências da Universidade de Lisboa. Uh, and he will tell you, tell you about uh, high throughput microscopy and screening. Thank you, Mariana. Good, good morning, ever, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see my presentation OK. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So let's, let's then talk about high throughput microscopy and, uh, and screening. So in, the, in, this, uh, in this presentation, I will start by doing some, uh, some definitions. We will, we will uh, speak about what is exactly high throughput microscopy. We'll talk about which assays are compatible with, uh, with uh, this group of, of, of techniques, so what sorts of instrumentation uh, is required and talk a little bit at the end about how to analyze the data coming out from the microscopy. Uh, even though I, I haven't defined exactly what is high throughput microscopy, uh, you would agree with me that this is not uh, uh, high throughput. So the, in the in the in the classical uh, low throughput um, uh, experiment setting, we, we would come up with with a, a testable uh, hypothesis. And see whether it is correct or not uh, for each individual hypothesis that you place. Uh, in 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 high throughput, uh, this is uh, uh, what we do. So the, the, there is uh, a way to to, to parallelize the, the experimental part. So the, we come up with, with with ways of performing many different experiments uh, at the same time and identify uh, which uh, which are the 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 relevant outcomes from the, the, the experiment. So this, this is very, very akin to, to fishing with a large fishing net, rather than with a single uh, fishing pole. And uh, as we are talking about the screening, so we use images for to, 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 for, 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 for the, the experimental part in our work. And, uh, and we use imaging because it, it, it because as, a, uh, as you all know, uh, we can uh, inspect many different kinds of uh, phenotypes with, uh, with, with microscopy, as we've seen with uh, all the, the previous presentations in this, in this webinar series. So you can use more microscopy to, uh, to, to, to probe different kinds of model systems from cells to tissue, even to, to whole organisms, and get uh, re resolution at, at any point from the whole organism to the cell and even to Subcell and molecular components of the cell. You can even do this in, in, in different uh, uh, dimensionalities. So in, in X, Y, and in, in, also in Z to, to count for the, 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 the third dimension. And you can also do these performing experiments for a long time and using different probes. It's very important to 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 talk about microscopy is that, uh, 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 especially if you talk about fluorescence microscopy, it is a quantitative uh, technique. So you you can extract quantitative data and measure differences in, in labeling or sensitivity in your cell. And we do, and if we, if we take uh, all of this in, in consideration, we'll, we can examine different kinds of, 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 of specimens, as you can see in this, uh, in this slide. Um, common to, to, to with all of these uh, specimens, the, that I'm showing you here is how how rich of a, of an information you, you can get out of these uh, images, and in all, in all these cases, you, you can see that each image each image ca captures a multitude of, of cells, and you, and you can extract different parameters uh, from uh, from each cell, and uh, and uh, and eventually uh, characterize uh, some of the phenotypes that the cells are showing, and some of them are really quite complex. 
are just the, the, the sources for the for this file. And when talking about uh, uh, about uh, high throughput uh, techniques and, and also a rate concept, uh, which is high content, the idea of uh, the idea is to use microscopy to to perform phenotypic characterization at the single cell level. What does the, this mean? That this means that, that we, are, we, are, we are using a technique which allows us to, to to characterize in in very high detail each cell uh, in our in our sample. There are uh, different uh, experimental data techniques which can address uh, this uh, problem. So, you, if you use full cytometry or single cell DNA or, or RNA sec, you can you can indeed get a single cell in information in a quantitative quantitative manner, but only microscopy can, 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 can give you time resolved in information to, to, to characterize the, the, the dynamics of the cells in your in your sample and uh, characterize the, the, the morphology of each cell, even with the subcellular resolution uh, if needed. And so what is hyperput microscopy? So I, I define hyperput microscopy as the automated microscopy Technology which allows the efficient capturing of large amounts of phenotypic data with high spatial and temporal resolution without human intervention. So it's using uh, technology to, to to automate many of the of the steps in uh, image acquisition and auto processing. Uh, very important. This is a quantitative uh, biology tool. So uh, the goal is always to to uh, to to extract quantitative data about the, the samples rather than just describing uh, the phenotype. And uh, and uh, and when uh, we when we we use uh, yeah, microscopy as a tool for drug discovery or, or identification of uh, of uh, hits, which are compounds or molecules which alter the cellular phenotype in a desired manner. And the, and the, 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 the kinds of uh, the, 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 in, in the settings so of the, the, uh, the, the parallelization of the, uh, of the experimental part consists in screening a large library of, of, of compounds, of, of molecules, which can be in the range of, uh, of thousands, using imaging and uh, without human intervention. Insight about microscopy is an interdisciplinary area involving microscopy, engineering, image analysis and data science. As I told you, uh, there are two, two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two, two concepts uh, that I will be uh, uh, throwing up uh, in this presentation. One of them is how to put my microscopy and the other related really one is high content analysis. So when talking to how to put my microscopy, we, we are referring either to Due to this automation technology, or the assays which 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 describe the phenotypes of individual individual cells based on one or a few image-based features. So the focus here is on simplicity. On the other hand, you can use imaging to, to, to perform high content analysis. That is, you can go at each image in your in your data set. And, uh, and and use uh, software to to extract uh, uh, a huge range of image-based features, which are multi-parametric, and and can and characterize each individual cell in your in your imaging data set in a multitude of uh, of ways. And so, what would you care care about single cells in your in your sample? Well, uh, first is, is that if, if you want to do to study complex phenotypes, uh, these are uh, more often than not revealed at the single cell level rather than at the ensemble level. On the other hand, if you analyze multiple cells, you get increased the statistical power and you can describe subpopulation uh, dynamics. So if you are studying uh, uh, cells which, which relate to, uh, if you are studying a, a, a process of wound healing, you, you may want to, 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 to describe whether cells which are located closer to the wound behave differently than cells which are 
farther away from the from the womb. And uh, and as you are using uh, imaging, you can go at each individual cell and characterize its subcellular uh, uh, impact. If you, if, uh, of course, uh, none of what I, what I uh, told you so, so far uh, uh, indicates that that adequate microscopy uses some sort of, of different basic uh, uh, microscopy uh, uh, setup. So in fact, uh, most of the of the of the, of the, of the techniques uh, which are amenable to 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 how to put uh, microscopy uh, uh, have already be, been presented by the, the previous speakers in this webinar series. So uh, you can use a white field process microscope or a, or a control pool or a spinning disk microscope to perform uh, high throughput microscopy. So the focus is here is not on the optics, it's rather on automation and efficiency. So the, 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 the goal is to, is to use uh, a microscope, which can feature one of these uh, techniques and automate it in, uh, in, uh, in such a way that, that you can uh, uh, perform many different experiments uh, at the same time in uh, what I call a screening campaign. So here, automation is not uh, is really essential for the, for the, the, the whole process. If you, if you if you study if you are screening a, a library with thousands of, of of compounds, you have no no uh, no option. Either you either your your microscope is automated to the to the point where it can perform uh, many uh, steps of the of, of the imaging process autonomously, or you will not be able to to efficiently screen uh, this large library of, of, of compounds. Uh, and, uh, and the, 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 the kind of, of, of information that, that you can get is, is, is mostly based on the, uh, the, the assay or the sample preparation. So which then which, uh, which assays can you, can, you, can, you, can you address with uh, high throughput uh, microscopy? Well, as I, as I told you, high, high throughput is, is based on is a, is a, is a screening that, Techniques, so it, it enables efficiency, efficiency uh, assessing the, the, the phenotype brought about cells treated with the collection of different uh, compounds, for instance. And of course, uh, and of course, uh, uh, each uh, uh, screening campaign is based on screening the collection of all different uh, reagents. This can be either based on nucleic acids, so you, so you can actually by siRNAs, shRNAs, microRNAs, or or even a collection of of, of priest or guide uh, RNA, which target the whole genome or or a subset of, of genes of, of of interest in the in the genome. So, for instance, we can buy siRNAs to targeting all kinases in the in the in the in the genome. You know, if, you, if you are looking for uh, and it is which which can be relevant for, for some biological process, or you can you can buy uh, libraries of, of 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 chemical compounds, which can which can be of, uh, of which contain hundreds, thousands, or even millions of, of different compounds, but probing different uh, uh, parts of the of the of the of the chemical uh, environment. And for uh, for uh, in the for for the, the screening campaign, you, you would first uh, design an uh, an essay which which captures the, the the phenotype which you are trying to 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 uh, characterize. You can either design a a a, a molecular system which. Which uh, which gives insight into the the, the activation of, of certain uh, uh, biological processes, or you can use model uh, organisms or, or or model cells and and, uh, uh, and use them in a way that that uh, uh, changes in, in their phenotype can be can be observed. And then 
you you you, you treat these uh, these model systems with, with your uh, library of compounds or 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 nucleic acids and identify hits which are the the compounds or nucleic acids which uh, produce the, the the desired phenotype and and then it, you will move on with a series of evaluation experiments eventually to 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 come up with a new drug candidate or with uh, a, 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 a with a set of therapeutic target genes in, in, in the case where you would be uh, doing RNA or DNA based screens. In the case of, of, of screens which target RNA or, or DNA, or DNA uh, libraries, uh, these screens are not, uh, uh, are usually titled functional genomic screens uh, given their specific uh, uh, goal. So with the, with the, with the, with the hypercoat uh, microscopy, you, you can you can really only um, uh, successfully can complete a screening campaign if you have this experimental uh, setup really well uh, defined. If you, you when you when you you formulate the the question that that you want to to, to answer and formulate a, a a hypothesis, this hypothesis will would eventually lead you to, to, to design an, an essay which can test this, uh, this uh, hypothesis, which we, and, and you will then use this, this essay to perform imaging and screen uh, the, the library of, of, of compounds that you are interested in, quantify the, the result and detect the, 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 the hits. So, the, the, the combination of the, of the essay imaging and the, and the quantification protocol uh, is usually defined as the the the, the, the output uh, workflow and it, it, it is essential that this work, work, workflow is defined before the start of the campaign. The goal is always to, to, to have simple essays which are reproducible and which have uh, and for which imaging is not very uh, for which you can, can you perform the efficiency. So, uh, giving you some, 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 some examples of, 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 of assays which are uh, compatible with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, high throughput uh, microscopy. Uh, and, and you will see that, that these are all simple assays which, uh, uh, which answer uh, 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 a few questions in a, in a really precise manner. So if you, if you are in, if you're interested in, in apoptosis and in, in, in identifying apoptotic uh, the compounds or compounds leading to leading to, to apoptosis, you can uh, use uh, 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 fluorescent reporter which which uh, which stains phosphatidylserine in the outer uh, of the of the of the plasma membrane and screen a, 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 a library of uh, compounds and see whether you, you have staining with this uh, uh, dosage, uh, uh, reporter uh, and or a decreased number of cells in your in your sample so, uh, the, the the outcome will, will, will would be to, to to detect whether you have increased stabling with this uh, dosage, uh, uh, if you if you if your work is it is concerned about the activation of, of transcription factors, you, you can have cells stains uh, 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 you can stain the, the nuclei of, 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 of these cells, you GFP to your uh, transcription factor and 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 and, uh, and detect whether this uh, factor is located primarily in the in the site in the in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. And it, if it's in the in, in the nucleus, it's uh, it should be uh, uh, most likely uh, if 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 if, you, if your study is, is concerned about molecular interaction, you, you can use uh, uh, techniques based on on uh, on immunofluorescence such as the, the proximity ligation assay, which uh, produces intense fluorescent labeling at the at the at the size where where you have binary protein protein. Uh, 
interactions. And in, the, in this case, we would be able to tell for each cell not only whether there is interaction and if there is at which places of the cell this interaction occurs. So in all, in, in all of, uh, of these cases, you, you, you have assays which produce a very clear uh, uh, outcome and you, you can use each, each of these uh, uh, setups to, to screen or libraries of, of compounds and test whether there is apoptosis, activation of transcription factor, or molecular interaction going on in the sample. Uh, on a, 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 a paradigmatic assay in, in, in hydrophobic is the, 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 the cell painting assay, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is used for, for cell, for profiling the, the cell response of cells treated with, with, uh, with uh, uh, known or unknown uh, compounds. And the way that the, this assay works is, 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 is the following. You, you get uh, uh, your, your cell line of, of choice. You, you incubate these cells in multiple plates with, with a collection of uh, compounds. You, you stain them with, with, with a collection of dyes, which I'll be talking about, which stain different cell organelles, and you uh, use software to, to describe whether, uh, in, in, in which way the, the organelle morphology was changed by the compound incubation. And the, 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 the clever part about cell painting is that you, that you use six different dyes uh, simultaneously, and, uh, and you dyes sustain uh, uh, staying uh, six different uh, cellular uh, compartments, and they can be imaged simultaneously with uh, uh, using five fluorescence channels. Uh, and these dyes stain the, the, the nuclei, the ER, the, the, the nucleoli, and the, and the other uh, organelles. And, uh, and, and using this, uh, this, uh, this combination of dyes, you can you, you can uh, inspect the the, 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 the macroscopy images and see that uh, some of these uh, uh, some of these compounds really change the, the the morphology of certain organelles. So, for instance, if you look at the the, the, mitochondria, the mitochondria of uh, control cells and compare them with the, with the mitochondria of cells incubated with this compound, you, you can see that uh, they have been condensed. And, and the location has changed in, in itself. Uh, the thing is, if you, if you, if you use uh, 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 image analysis the software to, to measure different features of each cell in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, in this set, you can extract from these six labels thousands of, 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 of different features, which uh, Characterize the, the way cells look at the, each individual fluorescence channel, and then come up with this psychological profile of the of the, of the cells treated with each each individual compound uh, in your chemical library. And if you do so, you can use uh, 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 clustering approaches and 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 uh, and uh, characterize the the, the the action of Unknown compounds in the, in the, in, the, in the following way. So if you if you if you if you if you're if you if you are testing an unknown compound, which clusters in the same cluster as this uh, known tubulin modulator, you, you, your hypothesis would be that this unknown compound most likely affects tubulin. Uh, then, since it's, it since it, it affects cellular morphology in a way similar to known to be modulated, and, the, and this is the, the the power of high content microscopy is that you can describe these very complex cellular phenotypes and uh, 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 and uh, give them either uh, some sort of biological explanation or come up with uh, uh, with molecules which can affect this. Uh, this phenotype in some sort of way. Uh, 
also let me uh, let me give you some some examples of the of of, of screening essays that that we that we are running in the in the in the facility, and uh, this is uh, we use functional genomics essays to 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 characterize uh, uh, membrane trafficking. In the, in this example, we, we, this is an essay based on on immunofluorescence and uh, and the uh, uh, fluorescent protein tag uh, uh, target protein to 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 investigate uh, different aspects of of the protein involved in the decision of disease cystic fibrosis and and this process can you can be whether mutations affect the location of, of, of this protein in the plasma membrane, but can be located in the plasma membrane in the wild type, but not in the in mutant cell line, or the way in which this NO1 protein, uh, its localization at the, at the plasma membrane is, is affected by different uh, SI RNAs. We also use uh, live cell assays to, to, to Characterize the the activation of the of the CFTR protein in intestinal uh, 3D organoids coming from uh, primary intestinal cells from from, from from patients, and to 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 describe whether this activation occurs or not uh, in, in the presence of uh, known or investigational compounds, and the way in which uh, different patients uh, may or may not. Uh, Respond positively to 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 investigational compounds, making this screening essay an excellent tool for personalized medicine. Yeah. And talking about uh, uh, live cell imaging assays, uh, so something we also do is just to use the uh, wound healing assays to to, to to clarify the ways in which uh, different mutants of the for the CFTR protein effect, the, the ability of cells to, to of uh, some layer to to close uh, a wound which has been uh, or or scratch which has been performed on the on, on the, the cell model layer. So uh, so far I've, I've talked about uh, uh, assays and and man biology, but uh, but, uh, but uh, at this point I should sure, sure, I should better to talk about the instrumentation and and how. Uh, uh, and how uh, and which considerations we need to be uh, have had when uh, performing uh, this essays essays in uh, in real life. So since this, since we are uh, talking about uh, screening, uh, we were uh, so uh, for almost every every situation, uh, you would present the, the your your specimen to the microscope in in without in some sort of multi-well plate which are typically uh, black if you, if you are talking about fluorescence like us to avoid crosstalk between uh, uh, individual wells but there are a bunch of different considerations you need to, to have about uh, which plate you you, you choose and, and which one can be better for your for your uh, essay uh, and i'm talking in detail about which kind of uh, plates and which kind of uh, for considerations you need to, to have for, for for each one. The most obvious is, it, is of course density. So you can you can uh, uh, perform your your essay in multi well plates of, of 96, 34, or 15, 36 wells. Of course, the more wells you 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 have, the the highest throughput you you, you get. But also, uh, uh, not, not, not all assays can may be performed on all uh, sorts of plates uh, because, uh, uh, depending on how large your your sample is and, and how and which uh, and uh, and the which considerations you need to be had regarding uh, uh, liquid transfer, uh, these considerations may be you to consider one well plate uh, over the, the other. Of course. Uh, Smaller wells also mean uh, lower reagent uh, usage. This is a uh, beneficial. You can also use uh, 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 a collection of, 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 of uh, uh, microscopy dishes or chamber uh, cover glasses, which can be divided into one, four, or eight uh, 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 
different chambers. So you, you can have for lower throughput experiments uh, up to eight different treatments in one uh, 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 cover glass. The, 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 the choice of, 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 of the bottom material of the, of the plate is also, is also important from, 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 from the, the, the previous part. You know that glass is, is always an, an, a, a great choice because it's, 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 it's flat, it has great optical properties, but for you to, to, to culture cells in a more well place, you need to, to perform to some sort of coating to the, to the glass. Uh, to compensate for this, uh, there are uh, also uh, plates which also have very thin uh, copper glass thickness uh, 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 polymers, so for, for plastic uh, polymers at, at, uh, at the bottom, which have similar uh, perform optical performance to glass, but just are cheaper. Uh, and the cyclohydrolophene is, is one of the most common polymers for, for this usage. If, if your if your work uh, deals with uh, spheroids or uh, or organoids, you can you can even buy these uh, these special plates which have these plastic bottoms, which are uh, uh, cone shaped, and uh, the idea is that uh, your your three D structure will, will will be formed at the very center of the of the well, facilitating uh, finding the the sample later on on the microscope. A very common um, uh, issue with uh, with different models of of, of multi-world plates is the 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 the, the skirt. So if you if you work with uh, with, with multi-world plates, you would know that the bottom of the of the weld does not uh, sit on whichever surface the the plate is is placed on. There is in fact uh, uh, um, uh, skirt at the edge of, of the plate, which raises it slightly higher than the, the surface where you would place your, your multi-wall plate on. So this, this, uh, this skirt is great because it, it prevents damage to the, to, the, to the optical surface at the bottom of the, of the plate. But if you are using a very high numerical aperture objectives, which, uh, which typically have a very small working distance, you need to be, to be really close to the to, to your specimen, i.e., the, the, the very bottom uh, of the well, having a very large skirt may uh, may uh, may make it impossible to have the uh, the uh, the uh, objective approach the wells at, at the very edges of the of the plate because uh, the objective may may even touch the the uh, the microscope stage, as you can see in this uh, cartoon here. Uh, for for uh, for that, you need to, to consider which kind of a plate you, you buy. So a typical skirt type for for cheaper plates may be up to one, one millimeter in, in height. But if you buy these broken elmer cell, cell carrier ultra micro plates, they have a very uh, small skirt height of only two two hundred micro micrometers, which can make it possible to uh, place your objective at the edges of uh, a multiple plate. Uh, I talked about flatness uh, a moment ago. So if, if you use a, a glass bottom plate, so you can see that, that this, the bottom of this uh, plate is actually uh, a cover slip, which is really large. So a, a cover slip uh, uh, covering uh, the whole area of the plate. So this, this should make the, the bottom really flat. But if you look carefully at this cycle all of the bottom plate, uh, you can see that uh, uh, it may not be very, may not be as flat as uh, the glass counterpart. And, uh, and and in fact, if you if you, uh, if you use uh, a, a microscope to, to to actually measure the 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 the, the fluctuations in the, on the on, on the height of the, of the the bottom of the of the plate, you, you would get this kind of focus map. So it, it defines where to the bottom of the of, of the plate is. And so for typical 3D for well plate from from Falcon, you can see that from the from the the highest to the, to the lowest part of the 
of the of the plate, we may have a, the difference of almost 100 uh, micrometers. And so, if you if you're imaging cells which are five to ten micrometers high, uh, having so such an uh, uneven uh, 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 surface to work on may be a problem uh, or not. So uh, this is uh, the variations across the, the, the whole plate. Uh, there, there are also variations within each well, if you, if you look carefully. And uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the high-end, uh, most well plate, you can get intra-well variations uh, as well as 6.2 micrometers. Uh, so, um, so uh, finding your 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 specimen in an automated manner in a place which can have this kind of configuration uh, uh, is an important uh, consideration to have uh, in your in your essay. So, if, if you're not if you're using uh, confocal or even collective microscopy and you cannot render your cells in focus with the microscope, uh, the essay. Uh, and the data you can get from it may be uh, uh, totally uh, useless at the end of the day. And so for, for that, uh, uh, the screening microscopes will, will, all, will, will all have uh, uh, mechanisms to, to perform autofocus before each uh, individual uh, image is acquired. So the, the mechanisms to, to ensure that, that the cells are brought in focus before an image is uh, is acquired. So the 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 most uh, 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 common mechanism for doing this is, is, is to use the software and uh, have the the microscope focus and, and defocus uh, uh, cells before acquiring uh, an, an image. And if you if you extract uh, uh, sharpness information about this uh, this uh, this step, you would see that you. You would have to, to, to place the, the, the objective somewhere in the, the 12 micrometer depth range for optimal sharpness. This is on, on the fly, but, but, it, but, it's, but it's, it requires that uh, collection of, of images to be acquired because this can pose the challenges in terms of the toxicity, bleaching, and also uh, time because you are acquiring more images which will not be used uh, for your uh, screen readout. For that reason, uh, 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 the, the, there are also hardware-based strategies for for uh, for autofocusing cells, uh, for autofocusing on on the, the multiple plate, and the, and the, these hardware-based autofocus solutions use an infrared LED laser, which is shined upon uh, the, the bottom of your your uh, um, uh, multi well plate, and because of the of the refractive index in the mismatch between air, which is refractive index one, and glass or or polymer, which is around one point five, uh, this uh, this laser is is refracted, brought back uh, into the the objective, and the 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 precise location of the of, of the reflection is 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 uh, detected. Because if if your if if your cells are placed in a, at a constant offset in said from the bottom of the of the multi well plate, uh, you can then apply the this offset and uh, and have you, your cells uh, uh, in, uh, in in good focus on uh, with uh, with uh, great speed. Uh, and uh, this can be done continuously, so as uh, so to to, to uh, Accounts for 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 z deviations as, as you move the, the stage in x y or uh, or as you 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 image cells across the long time lapse. What this can be done on demand, so as it's working when when you when you want to to, to, to image a particular cell at a particular location in a multi well set. Uh, different. Uh, uh, Microscopy manufacturers call their systems different names, but the, 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 the working principle is always the, the same. Uh, to, to, 
to it's actually image a a a multiple plate on a on a on a, on a high throughput microscope. You would typically uh, load, load the microscope with the, with the, the precise dimensions of uh, of each plate the of the plate the, 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 that you are using. And acquire at each well one or a collection of different positions uh, to to uh, to image cells located at those uh, positions. In real life, this is, this is what uh, what it looks like. So you, you can have your 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 microscope image the the, the entire well or course uh, characterization of your of your samples, or or you can image Different suppositions within this well to have cellular you know, or subcellular information about the the, the cells and, and, the, and describe each one in terms of of, uh, of the phenotypic features that may be extracted from each individual image. So, which uh, which uh, microscopes can, can be used for high throughput applications? There, there are actually. Uh, uh, a large uh, set of, uh, of equipment which can perform high throughput imaging, and and it, and and they can be as as simple as a conventional uh, 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 microscope, which which has uh, uh, full automation in, in terms of all of its optical components, and also uh, uh, the possibility of, of of these of its optical configuration being controlled by the the computer. This is the example of, of one of the, of the microscopes we have in at our facility. You can see that, that, that this is an, an inverted microscope. Uh, it can focal one, by the way, as you can see by the, the, the focal scan head uh, at the side. So uh, the, the, the big difference is that, uh, 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 that all, all components, uh, including objectives, stage, uh, 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 and the interpretation of remotely controlled by uh, by the computer in, in a way that is that uh, allows it to to image a multiple plate in its entirety in full automated mode. These automated uh, uh, microscopes are are great because they they, they are flexible. You, you can perform high throughput or low throughput experiments on, on them. Uh, you can uh, you can easily access all the all the, uh, all the components. It's, it's easier to 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 to, to, to access all, all of these components. It's easier to to, to upgrade. It's, it's it's maybe a bit cheaper than other uh, alternatives. But for 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 dedicated high throughput imaging, uh, uh, you can get these high content analysis systems, which I uh, called uh, the, the microscopes in a box. So you can imagine that this uh, box is actually a a, a, a wide field microscope, but all the all these components are placed inside the the, 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 the box and are, are not accessible to the to the user. All of them being controlled by the the, the computer. The only interaction that that, that the, the user has. With the with the with the instrument is by with via this small port here, which is used for putting and and retrieving a a remote call plate. The, that being said, these systems are are, are highly optimized for high throughput imaging, and are uh, uh, really easy to to use and really optimized for for what is task much more than. An automated conventional microscope. The, I will give you an example of, of, of a few of these uh, systems. So, uh, so Zeiss has this uh, cell cover uh, seven, which is a modular uh, high content imager. So you, you can see that it, it's a box. You can see that, that there is a small drawer here for for placing a, a multiple plate, and uh, which you can see in more detail here, and the the, the, the the great thing is about this, uh, this microscope is that Zeiss has built this fully automated uh, objective, which can uh, perform optical corrections and uh, photo immersion uh, in a fully automated way, even even 
if, if you can see that, that they are within the box and the user ne has never access to, 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 to them. Uh, the system is, 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 is fully modular, so you, you can uh, customize it with different numbers of uh, cameras for, for, for wide field imaging with or without a, a focus scan head with and without capabilities for, for doing the lifestyle imaging. So you can have a very powerful system which can be used for lifestyle, confocal, high content imaging uh, in a box which, which has a very uh, intuitive uh, software and is easy to use. It's, 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 it's so easy to use that, that it can even detect which kind of plate it has. It's the dimensions and which kind of material at the bottom is, is, is made of. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and uh, this is the the, the the system which has these as I told you this the objectives with adaptive optics. So you can, so in, in this casing for for the, the objective, we have uh, remotely controlled gears which can uh, which can adjust for the uh, the the which can adjust the the, the correction for for uh, for the. the the, the thickness of the, of the bottom of your, of your plate in much the, the same way as you would uh, uh, adjust the, the core, the, the correction ring in the, in the manual lens. And the, the water immersion is, is uh, the auto of water immersion in that uh, uh, the system has a, a silicon membrane placed between the multiple plate and the, the objective. And Water can, can be either injected or, or removed at the the, the interface uh, for uh, to, to to enable immersion or dry imaging uh, on demand. G also has this uh, also has these, these uh, uh, in cell analyzer systems in both wide fields and lens scanning uh, uh, uh variants. Which also support uh, lifestyle imaging and also uh, image uh, enhancement using software. Procanel Elmer has the the, 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 the opera and the the, the, operator, the operator systems. These are spin disk uh, systems, uh, uh, which which uh, which uh, form three D imaging. They are very very versatile. You can up you can have up to eight LED light sources or or, or a selection of or state state measures, which can even enable you to do threads uh, of fluorescence uh, uh, transfer imaging and also lifestyle imaging in the system. And the 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 great thing about the 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 opera the, the opera Phoenix system is that. It can, it can uh, combine up to four cameras at once, and relation with uh, two uh, with two uh, laser lines in, the, in the, simultaneously to really multiplex uh, the also uh, uh, the imaging of different fluid pores within the the, the the sample. If you have uh, multiple labeling required in your assay. Uh, these systems can, can 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 even be configured with with a liquid handling module, which can be placed on top of the of the of the so, so that liquid can be injected uh, in the in the plate within the microscope. If, if you are investigating the fast kinetics and want to, to, to measure uh, 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 life cell responses to adding uh, uh, some reagent uh, in, in the assay. Uh, different uh, and then you also have similar systems by other uh, manufacturers. And this is a a a a, a, a high throughput microscope in, in action. So this, this is our white full system in the in the facility. And you can see that it is uh, uh, that the the software has been um, uh, configured with the the precise dimensions of of the plate and the microscope is. Moving uh, the plate in the in the stage and performing multicolor um, imaging in in one field mode for the project. Uh, 
the if you for if you if you are doing the lifestyle like imaging assay, you, you can also take, take advantage of these incubator boxes in the conventional more microscope. And in this case, uh, what is being imaged is, is a collection of microscopy slides, uh, which has been uh, and in this case, you, what, what are being images are cells uh, dividing under the influence of, of, of the collection of the different SI RNAs. So I'm I'm pretty much at the end. I, I, I don't have uh, much more time to to, to speak. I will just briefly speak about analyzing the, the data from uh, I could put in high content microscopy. So uh, because you you are uh, you are doing parallelization on the, on the imaging, it means that uh, you cannot possibly manually analyze each image uh, uh, that you require. In hyperfluid mode. This also means that the only way that, that you can extract data from, from these images is if you, is if you uh, are able to put forward some phenotype with some sort of numerical features. So, I think with microscopy, it's, all, it's, it's always, always, always a quantitative microscopy technique. And the, 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 the importance of, 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 of labeling, sorry. The importance of labeling is, is that uh, since, since we're using software to, to analyze images, you have to label your your cells in such a way that you, not only your phenotype is being reported, uh, but also that you contain uh, that. But also, if that if you need to to have additional dyes to 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 assist in image segmentation or or, or feature extraction, that you add these dyes. Uh, one, one common case is, is uh, that you, you had hooks to, to, to your cells to, to be able nuclei to aid segmentation, or that you use devices such as HDS cell mask, which perform a uniform labeling of, uh, of cells and allow you to, 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 to measure whether the average area of your cell has changed or not. Uh, the, Depending on which compound you treat your your cells with, so in, in this case, an inhibitor of the vaccine polymerization, and you can see that uh, this causes cells to, to decrease their overall size. We have the rise in the, the range of the emission and the expectation uh, wavelengths. Uh, this, this is all well and good, especially if you have sparse cells, but if, but if you have uh, closely located cells. A simple threshold may not uh, may not adequately separate adjacent cells. And for 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 this case, uh, the hooks thing is 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 very useful because it can perform seeded segmentation and for identify where the, the the nuclei are and then grow each nucleus to uh, until you find. The, each cytoplasm in the vicinity of each nucleus, and so for 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 a typical for a typical quantification of all of the hypothetical image, you would first start with with uh, with uh, your image with uh, multi-level cells, pick up the, the the nuclear channel, perform this segmentation as as we as we we done before. Then dilate the, the nuclei to find the, the remaining of the cytoplasm, and then include cells which which are not uh, which are not uh, useful for your analysis. And these may be the the cells which are located at the edge of the frame. So you may not want to, to analyze half cells. You may only want to analyze uh, uh, full cells. You want you may want you may want, you may want to exclude cells which are either too small or too large. So cells which is undergoing some process of cell death, with, which may not be of interest. You maybe exclude elongated nuclei for the same reason, and also exclude cells which don't express your protein of interest or which have saturated fluorescence, uh, saturated uh, pixels in the, in the presence stage. And at the end of the day, quantify a collection of cells that's treated with a collection of different compounds. 
perform data normalization and then you identify the hits, which will, will be cell grid, which, which, which show extreme phenotypes in, in, in some way. So extreme responses to the production of compounds in your, uh, in your uh, library. And with that being said, uh, I, 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 will, I will finish my, my presentation and, uh, and answer any questions that may have arisen during the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ubu. Thanks a lot. Um, so um, uh, we'll have time for um, maybe one short question, maybe maybe two in the interest of, 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 of time. If you have other questions for, for Ubu, you can also contact him later. I'm also going, probably going, we're also probably going to make a five minute break between Ubu and Gabi's um, uh, talk, the next talk. Um, so we have three people raising uh, hands. Um, I'm, uh, Clara, do you want to start? Let me, I want to allow you to talk. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, so I think my question is uh, very short. Um, regarding your um, <clears throat> analysis, so which software do you usually use? And uh, regarding your different steps of segmentation, do you decide um, based on your image uh, and take the, those cells based on your decision or do you script that as well? Okay, so, so the, 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 the first question is which software do you, is used for, uh, for, uh, for analysis? So it, it depends on, on, the, on the application and your skill and also your, your, uh, your preference. So as a, uh, we are big fans of, of, of open source cell software. So we either use uh, ImageJ or, or or self is an open source software which can perform batch image analysis um, really easily using the similar operations as you would in ImageJ. Uh, but if you but if you have the, the the skills either yourself or at your facility, you can you, you can of course devise a script on 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 on, uh, on Python or, or or MATLAB or using and, or using any other to, to the, that you uh, would like. So the, it's, there are everything which may work can be used. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, the second question is, is uh, uh, what are the, the decisions involved in, uh, in cell segmentation? Uh, this is all essay based. So each, each essay would perhaps consider a different uh, collection of, 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 the, of the, decisions and this is why before moving on into a large screen uh, every screening campaign requires uh, a small pilot screen to be performed at the, at the, at the beginning to identify which are, are the relevant factors uh, that need to, to be taken in the intro account so it, it, uh, I've, I've talked about the, the most common ones but this is all decided on an essay to the essay okay thanks thank you Paul. Okay, we have another question from uh, Miguel Siavaga, also raised the hand. Uh, let me see. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, it was a very nice talk. I have a very practical question, which is mm -hmm. how many systems are there available in CoLife and uh, are they available for external use? Well, uh, um, uh, uh, I cannot answer about, uh, uh, about CoLife. Since we are not uh, part of CoLife, but but at uh, but at at the Institute, we have two two systems which are uh, available to 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 to, to external use. So one on focal and one uh, wide field. Um, and uh, I don't know whether whether someone from from CoLife would would like to add well, on other systems. About the systems on collapse, so there'll be a, a webinar, a collapse webinar on microscopy on, on, on the facilities. That's probably the best time to um, uh, to see which systems are available, how you can use them. So the next webinar, I believe it will be on February 18th, I think, uh, but we'll announce it to all the CoLife um, uh, uh, community. Um, and you get to see in more detail what which what each imaging facility has to offer to the CoLife um, to the CoLife uh, uh, community. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, mm -hmm. just one final question. Dinesh, you also raise your hand. If you can be very brief in the interest of, 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 of time so that we make a break before Gabby's talk. Go ahead. Dinesh, are you there? Uh, hello. Ah, hello. Hello, audible? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Josh. Thank you. Uh, hi, hi, Hugo. Uh, my question is, what is the significance of applying self painting in detection of alpha tabulin in the neuron than other means and how? Sorry, uh, I didn't get your, your question. What is, it, what is the relevance of using self painting uh, in, in which essay? Self painting in the detection of alpha tubulin in neuron than other means, like uh, with uh, fluorescent fluorescence microscope. Then your uh, what uh, uh, high throughout the screening facilities. What will be the significance difference? So, so it. Um... So uh, um, uh, cell painting is used for for for, for describing the, the broader cell phenotype. So if if you are so if it involves staining with with these six different uh, fluorophores, so it, I, I don't think it, it would be uh, easily compatible with with uh, with also detecting tubulin because you would be adding an additional dye, so a, a seventh dye. And so it, it it may be um, uh, hard to. to Incorporate tubulin on the on the on, on the assay itself. That, that being said, if if you have compounds which disturb tubulin or or, or which or proteins which which interact with tubulin in, in, in some way, if you, if you perturb cells with with, with these molecules and and see uh, 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 specific changes with with the the, the cell painting, it, this would be one way to do the, the assay to, to answer. Uh, part of your of your question. Okay. Thanks a lot, Thank Hugo. You. Thank you. Thank you all. So um, let's make a five minute break. Uh, let's be back at twelve um, uh, twelve <laughs> for uh, Gabi's talk. So see you in five minutes, everybody. Rino, can I just test my share screen? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Let's try it. Is it showing up? Yep. Excellent. See you in five minutes or? See you in five so. minutes. All right.
Hello. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, Dinesh, I'm going to mute you, okay? I can affect all the... Uh -oh. So, um, welcome back. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Gabi Martin. She is uh, a head of uh, the Advanced Imaging at Instituto Quebec in Ciencia. He's a very experienced bioimaging specialist. Um, he has organized several courses and uh, created the uh, the, the EMBO practical course on 3D developmental imaging that's been running, I think, already for seven years, Gabi? Actually, uh, 12. 12 years. <laughs> um, uh, Gabi is, is, is really a, a, an imaging specialist, as I, will tell, as I was telling you. He also developed uh, an optical tomography microscope. It's a fully open source, low cost solution. It's called OpenT. With it, he acquired some images that earned them the first prize in Nikon's <laughs> small world competition in 2013. Gabi, it's always a pleasure to hear you. Thank you. Zay, thank Go you ahead. so much. It was very kind of you, to, over generous of you. Thanks a lot. Uh, good morning, everyone. <coughs> I, apo I apologize if I sound a bit weird, but I'm a little bit under the weather. I'm going to try my best to give you a sort of a broad overview of what large scale imaging in the context of microscopy is and what kinds of things you may be able to do um, in co-life, in the laboratories of co-life. And I'm going to touch on some concepts um, that, that were mentioned already. I just want to make sure I repeat this so you understand the, rele the relevance of it now. And the concept of transparency and translucency um, may not be immediate to some people. But if I ask what transparent, a transparent thing is, I think most of you will immediately think of a window, glass window, um, and the ability to see through glass very clearly. That's the common day definition of transparency. Translucency might not be so obvious to most of you, but translucency is what we turn our windows into when we put these shades, which allow light to go through, but give you some privacy. People are not uh, able to see inside your house once you put these shades, and that's what uh, most of the times they do. You can also have these shades, um, which actually allow you to sleep because you have no light. Uh, biological materials can also have these properties. So um, if a biological material is completely opaque, there isn't much we can do with that biological material inside a microscope. Looking at things in, in biological materials in microscopes require that light actually goes through the biological material and interacts with it. And that somehow on the other end of the optical path, we can generate a higher image that gives us information about what's inside um, biological material. That isn't to say that there isn't anything interesting on the surface, that if we could eventually just watch the surface, but that, that would be a topic of other, of other lectures. Um, the, the, the important aspect here is that biological materials have both these properties of being transparent and translucent. And the translucent part is actually the challenging part for us. On an isolated cell that you can take, for example, from your inner cheek and put on a microscope, most of them are very flat and they're actually quite transparent. In fact, so transparent that it's relatively difficult to image them with a simple conventional microscope. Many of you probably remember doing this experiment in school and it was not that easy to see the cells. You required special contrast techniques very often to see them. If you're working on a cell culture room and you want to look at your cells, you've noticed that you need a special kind of microscope that does face contrast in order to see your cells, otherwise they're too transparent. <coughs> Apologies. So um, that's because they are in fact very transparent, but once you start piling up cells on top of other cells, and you're looking at actually not just individualized cells in culture, but um, a whole multi-layer of uh, organ or organism with multiple layers, you realize that even though individual cells can be quite transparent, a bunch of cells clumped up together um, 
make up for a tissue that is actually more translucent than transparent. And that becomes a challenge if you're interested in studying um, tissues and cell organization and tissue organization. Part of the reason why that happens is that we got lots of things happen to light as they go through biological materials and biological materials are made up of many different components. And each one of the components that we're all build upon as a different refractive index. And I remember David already mentioned this and Zay also in their talks, that as light goes through different biological, uh, different materials, it can actually bend depending on the density, the optical density of that material, it can bend at two different degrees. And we can measure this bend, we call this phenomenon refraction, and you see it represented here by this pencil, which looks like it's broken when light coming from this side of the pencil goes through through water and then has to go through air before reaching our eyes. What's happening here is that as light goes through air and vacuum, it travels on a straight path. But if it encounters, for example, water, it, it bends like 33% towards one side. If it then finds lipids, it bends even more. If it finds sugars, it continues bending more. If it goes through protein, it bends even more, as much as 50%. And when we prepare samples and put them in the microscope, we're also going through glass. So very early on, um, the manufacturers, uh, because objectives in optical microscopy are made up of glass, have basically optimized the whole system in order to have the perfect corrections. If you remember David's talk where he showed you the multiple lenses inside an objective, a microscope objective, and all the corrections that they're um, designed to make most of the times, the microscopes are designed and the objectives of the microscopes are designed to, to look at things that basically have the refractive index of glass. This would be considered the ideal refractive index. But live biological materials are not made of glass. Even though protein can has, or purified protein has the same refractive index as glass, we, we're not a, a, an amalgamation of pure protein. Only a small portion of biological material is actually protein. So what happens to light when we're actually observing live, fresh biological material in microscopes is kind of like what happens with the sunlight when it goes through air and water on the clouds and it scatters all over the place. Scattering is this phenomenon of, um, if we know where the light is coming from, imagine for example, a, a laser beam and we know exactly how to describe its direction. Once it goes through the scattering material, in this case, the clouds, the light just spreads everywhere, scatters everywhere. And it's quite convenient for us on Earth because we have an homogeneous illumination. It allows you to see things very well, but it doesn't so work so well in the microscope because it doesn't allow us to distinguish the details on the surface of, in this, in this case, the cloud, but if you want a cell, which is what we're normally talking about on the microscope, what's inside, what's outside, what's on top of other things. So it's, it's extremely difficult to get detail out of this. And we'll address this in, in a little uh, moment again. So some of you may have heard this idea that zebrafish are transparent and they're very good for studying in the, the microscope because they're transparent. And, and, this, and this is uh, commonly said, but it's not 100% accurate. In fact, zebrafish, parts of a zebrafish are in fact transparent, transparent enough that you can image uh, with detail. In this case, for example, the internal ear details can actually be seen from the outside. But part of it, a lot of it, is actually translucent as well. This part where you have lots of organs. So it's extremely difficult here to get a lot of detail because there's so many different tissues and so many different characteristics that it becomes difficult to maintain the light properties consistent and, and get details um, over this. And then there's the obvious the zebrafish is called zebrafish because it has these patterns of black pigmentation, uh, which make it extremely opaque. The eye, for example, is in, almost impossible to, to observe properly in its natural um, state by using um, fluorescence microscopy. So a, a good biological sample to image in, in the microscope in three dimensions so you can actually see the detail inside it has to have a really good degree of transparency um, you have to have its translucent um, nature under control, and there are ways to do that. We'll see it in a moment. And it cannot be opaque. If it is opaque, there's no chance of you being able to see any detail inside this biological material. 
There's also another interesting concept here, which you may have experienced. I'm sure um, all of you have experienced this in life, but probably some of you may not have given it any thought. But if you hold a lamp, and this is actually not a perfect example, because the bulb itself seems to be emitting red light. But if you hold a regular lamp in your, in your hand, and you turn it on, you will notice that the light coming out is almost invariably red shifted. And that's not because our blood is red. It's actually because blue light scatters a lot more than red light. It's part of the reason why actually we see the sun as blue during the daylight. The blue light is absorbed and scattered inside biological material, so it doesn't come out. The red light has um, more um, ability, more facility to actually escape the biological material and go through it. Violet light or blue light, it's actually, as I said, quickly scattered and absorbed. And it's in fact, one of the reasons why violet light, uh, ultraviolet light can be dangerous is because it's absorbed so fast that it actually interacts with molecules and alters the molecules. Um, so in, in microscopy, um, we can actually extend a little bit the capabilities of confocal microscopy by using red shifted illumination. And some of you may have actually seen this, that lately the, 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 the red shifted fluorescent proteins are becoming more and more popular as people realize that with these, you can actually image deeper and deeper into biological materials. Um, if, if you have not experienced this next time you're at the microscope, you may actually notice that if you're using a red shifted dye for looking at nuclei, for example, like Topro or others, you can actually image much deeper, many more cell layers deeper than you would have if you're using the conventional uh, DAPI, which is excites with ultraviolet and then emits uh, in, in the blue, as you know. So for convenience, um, we still use a lot of blue dyes like DAPI, or the GFP, which you know, uh, it, it's the most widely spread fluorescent protein for which we have the most constructs. But the tendency in the last few years has actually been to create constructs and people shifting towards red shifted dyes because of the advantage of imaging in whole organs or, organ, or, or, or organisms under the microscope. And there's actually a trick which uh, Zehin already alluded to, which is called multi-photon microscopy which is the trick of using actually two photons of light to generate the same effect as a blue shifted uh, photon. On conventional confocal microscopy, if you're trying to look at GFP, for example, you know that you're using blue light. Blue light goes through your biological material. This, the objective is focusing it on a very tiny spot that flies through your sample. And as the spot is flying through the sample, you're basically generating green fluorescence. The green fluorescence travels in the opposite direction, is picked up by the objective, and it's detected by whatever detector you're using. On a multi-photon microscope, the, um, the geometry, the microscope, is pretty much the same as on a regular confocal microscope. But instead of using blue light, a laser of blue light, we're actually using a pulsed laser, a laser that bursts light in very, very uh, small uh, moments of uh, in time. And instead of blue light, we're actually using infrared light, typically light with twice, about twice the wavelength of the normal light that we use in the microscope. So the blue light is about 480 nanometers, ultraviolet is around 350 or 400 nanometers. If you double this, you end up on the near infrared uh, regime, about 700, 800, 900, and even 1000 nanometers of light. Beyond 700 nanometers, the human eye can no longer see this light. So to us humans, this light is invisible. But if we could see it, and if we could put this infrared light in our hands, we could see that it actually, a lot more of it is, is coming out of our hand, even more than just with the regular um, red light that you would see typically if you had a white bulb on your hand. So we, by using infrared light, we take advantage of the fact that the infrared light goes deeper it scatters less inside biological material, but we still have this problem. We need to excite our GFP molecules, which is normally what we have inside biological materials. And how can we do that? Blue light is more energetic than red light. Um, and, and there's sort of a, a relationship between the wavelength and the amount of energy that it has. Very, um, 
in, in summary, you can just say that half of the wavelength means twice the energy. So if you need one photon to excite one molecule of um, GFP, and you need one blue photon, maybe you can do the same trick with two photons of infrared light, which have about each one half of the energy. The trick to doing this is that you need to concentrate those two photons of red light in time and space in order to generate that effect. And it's a two photon or multi photon effect because it actually refers to like a double punch that these two photons will generate. But for this double punch to occur with really a high um, probability, you really need to concentrate these in time and space. Now the concentration in, in, in space is done by the objective. Use an objective that focuses the light on a very tiny spot, very much the same way as a confocal microscope does to blue light when you're scanning through your sample. To concentrate it in space, you need a pulsed laser. And this pulsed laser will actually pulse the light in little bursts that last for about 100 femtoseconds. And 100 femtosecond is about the time that a photon of light takes to go through a human hair about it. So just for you to have an idea of how brief these pulses of light are, generating these pulses of light is extremely expensive. That's one of the reasons that, one of the reasons why microscopes, confocal microscopes are not operating with two photon despite its advantages. Just the laser itself costs more than 100,000 euros, typically closer to 150,000 euros. Um, luckily in Lisbon in CoLife, we actually have um, multi-photon microscopes, at least at IMM, at the Champali Mo and at the Gulbenkian Institute. Um, so if you're interested in the technique, if you're looking at very large samples, organoids, embryos, and you're interested in the technique, you can come talk to any of us and see how you can have access to this uh, technique. I believe Rino also shows you this example. One of the advantages of two photon um, or the characteristics of it is that the excitation of light occurs really only where the light is concentrated in time and space. And that only happens on the focal plane. So you no longer need the pinhole to be able to discriminate only the light that comes from the focused plane. So you don't need the pinhole and you can actually collect all of the light that comes from this plane. Uh, you don't have to reject any light typically which makes the construction of a two photon actually simpler than constructing a confocal microscope. It's not a typical to actually build your own two photon system. Um, but it also has some, some of its disadvantages. Um, the slight disadvantage besides the fact that it's more expensive, as I said, is that the resolution tends to be a little bit lower. And if you remember the, the formula of resolution that was explained on Tuesday, you, you know that there's a very intimate relationship between the wavelength that you're using and the resolution. The longer the wavelength, the more towards the red side of the spectrum that you're using the light to image your sample, the, the lower the resolution. So two photon microscopes will actually give you typically lower resolution than can focal microscopes. However, because of this ability to penetrate deeper into tissues, you have you know, a larger scale of tissue that you can now actually image and actually get meaningful information out of, which you, you couldn't on a typical confocal microscope. I'll get back to this in a moment, just to give you an example of work that we have done here at the Gulbenkian Institute with the two photon. This is done by Camille from the Martins group. They're interested in, in following uh, lymphocytes in, inside actual biological tissue, inside organs in the mouse. And um, they've done this in live, uh, in live imaging but they've also done this with cleared samples, and I'll explain again what a cleared sample is, which basically allowed us to image through a whole millimeter of tissue. Um, as you can see this in this column, where it goes slice by slice, and then it builds up the whole column of tissue. And you can see the thousands of cells that are uh, made up of this uh, Timas uh, tissue. Another example that we use very often, is, and it's um, used very, very often for two photon microscopy, is uh, imaging embryo development. In this case, this is done by Andre Diaz, by the, who works with Moisés Melhor at the IGC as well. And you have several examples here of things that we have done with two photon microscopy, where in this case, there was actual, <laughs> these were actually uh, imaged. Uh, after fixation, post-mortem, and the tissues were clear, and then they were reconstructed in three dimensions, and we were actually able to see through the whole embryo, which would not be possible with a conventional anaphylical microscopy. It requires a few hundred microns, and that's typically way too much 
for blue light, if you're using blue light to excite GFP, it will eventually scatter um, and you won't be able to. I mean, I mean, those of you who have used canfocal microscopy may have gone through this um, frustration of you acquire a full Z stack and by halfway through your embryo or your very large tissue, you've seen that, you start seeing that I, I can't, the signal is very weak. I can't tell any details anymore. That's simply because the scattering of light is just overpowering. And you can, all, you, you can even, you can still detect a little bit of light, but you can't even make up any detail because the point spread function, if you remember this concept of point spread function, starts scattering out, starts enlarging. And then after a while, there's no longer detail uh, in, in the light that you're collecting back from the microscope. But on the two photon, you can actually track these embryos over long periods of time and even see this expression of this protein being produced and degraded and produced and degraded in cycles. So it's, it's, it's an interesting technique for studying embryos and large uh, organs. Now, I want to step back a little bit and go back to something that Hugo was just saying the session before, the concept of high throughput microscopy. And this has been another very interesting development um, of, of microscopes in, in the last few years, where everything has been automated, motorized, and, 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 and controlled by software. And, and those of you who have used modern microscopes have gone through this frustration of having to learn all of these complicated softwares and options and things to do. And that has brought us this, not just this amazing opportunity to do high content screening and automate the acquisition of thousands of cells, but it allowed us to do this, this thing that we call island stitching, which is basically a way of obtaining high magnification, high resolution images of incredibly large areas without having to have an incredible, incredibly large camera. Um, this is basically the, the technology, the Google Earth technology brought into the microscopes, where we can take a, like a quick snapshot of a very large, a whole section of an organ that would be far too large to image with a high magnification objective, but you can actually take a snapshot of it on, a, on, a, on an automated microscope capable of high throughput acquisition. And then you can acquire multiple, um, you can define an area where you want the microscope to go because the stage is motorized and the switching of objectives is motorized as well. The microscope can actually go to each individual portion of this area and acquire a high resolution image and acquire multiple images of this automatically, and then stitch all of these tiles together and create and generate a, a Google Earth large image. Now, I, I want to mention this because this is becoming more and more prevalent and practically every lab in CoLife now has a microscope capable of doing this. Um, I think Miguel Sabri was uh, wondering before about this. Uh, most of the times it's really just a matter of uh, getting to, to know the, the, the software and whatever limitations it has, because some softwares have uh, limitations and, and others have other characteristics. But the, the, this is, um, it's not too complex to do. It does require a little bit of work. There's an easier way to do this is by using what's called a slide scanner. Uh, the Champalimo actually has one of these in Lisbon where you can load up to a hundred different slides and it'll just stay there overnight scanning the slides for you. You come in the next day and you have you know, terabytes of, of images to, to take home and, and analyze. The challenge there is, is actually to, to analyze these images. And it involves a lot of um, te technology that Hugo was mentioning about image processing and detecting cells and all of this. Uh, at the um, Gulbenkian, we actually have a microscope that has uh, not four, but eight, uh, a slide insert that allows you to put up to eight slides. So we can also do this. And, and I'm sure it's possible also on the other um, institutes at CoLife to have more than one slide or at least one slide where you can scan the whole slide. Uh, just ask for help if you're interested in this technology. So what, what, how can this be useful for you? So in this case, um, once again, an example from, from Vera's group, from Camila, where they were interested in finding the specific cells, not just live, but actually with a little bit more magnification and after immunostaining. So this is an image taken from about, it's a composite of about 500 images taken on a white field microscope. So the tissue was sectioned and then stained and then put on a slide and it was too large to image with high magnification with the magnification that would give you individual 
uh, cell resolution. But once you acquire these hundreds of images and you stitch them together, then you have this kind of Google herd image that you can browse through an, an, an image. One of the challenges of this is that image J, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, does not handle these images very well. It's still, it's still a challenging type of image for image J, but there are other softwares that can very easily handle these images. And one that I highly, highly recommend is QPath, which is really um, very well suited for making uh, analysis and, and browsing through these images. Uh, this can be done also with um, conventional histological sections. And we also have a slide scanner at the Gulbenkian Institute in the histology, uh, pathology and histology uh, unit that can do this for you. But for fluorescence, uh, in our case, you have to use um, a conventional microscope which in some cases has advantages because you can go up to 100x. Uh, it's just that it's crazy. If you're trying to do an a large area like this at 100x, it may mean thousands of tiles and, and terabytes of information. So there's always um, a planning of the experiment that you have to do. Now, this, this ability to look at huge amounts of information uh, at high detail um, has brought on this new concept for uh, microscopy that we now actually call these mesoscopy, looking at very, very large things with in three dimensions and with high magnification. And in fact, some groups have been developing objectives that are far larger than your regular objective. I mean, if this is the size of a regular microscope objective, this is the size of a, of a meso lens, which is a new type of lens that was developed recently um, for doing confocal microscopy in very large samples and still obtain uh, quasi or near cell resolution and do three-dimensional imaging. Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned this is that as far as I remember, and David may give us more details, the Champali Mo was actually working on a project to implement one of, the, uh, one of these systems in their, um, in their facility or in one of the labs at the Champali Mo Foundation. And this is, the, I believe, very much the future for some microscope techniques where you get low magnification objectives but with a much higher, the, the, the concept here is space bandwidth product. It's, it's a concept different from resolution. It's in fact, how much information an objective can give you, given the full field of view that you can attain with that objective. And it turns out that high numerical aperture objectives, like the ones typically used in confocals, can give you the maximum resolution that you can get according to the physics of light but they can only do that on a very, very small field of view. If you start reducing the magnification, but improving the quality of the lenses and the manufacture of the lenses, you realize that low magnification objectives actually can, even though they cannot give you a higher resolution than the high magnification objectives, they can give you way, way much more information than a regular 100 or 60X. And that's because even though it's a reduced resolution, the area increases exponentially for these low magnification objectives. And this is the concept of a meso lens. It's a low magnification intermediate numerical aperture objective. And if with a regular 60 or 100X objective, you can only get about one to four megapixels of information. With a meso lens, and some stereoscopes actually come with objectives that are meso lenses, like the, 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 the MVX from Olympus, for example, you can actually get as much as 100 megapixels of real information out of these objectives. This is actually quite interesting. The advantage of this is that you no longer have to take multiple tiles and stitches. You can just take an overall quick, fast picture where you'll have enough resolution to identify thousands of cells. So this is the concept of, of meso lens and meso imaging in a nutshell. In this case, 2D and 3D as well. And, 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 and this concept of mesoscopy is a fairly recent thing, just to give you a broad um, view of things that we typically want to look at in microscopes and that we've been talking about in these webinars. Uh, super resolution, you only do normally with high magnification objectives. Confocal, you normally do with 60X objectives and 40X, sometimes 20. And you, on, on a regular confocal microscope, you can have the laser go as deep as about 100 microns, which is about the thickness of a human hair. With two photon, you can go two, three, four, five times deeper than that. Depends a lot on the tissue, but you can expand the scale in depth you can image. 
Um, but eventually, some things are way too large, are even larger than what's possible with this. And that's where new technologies like light sheet and optical tomography um, jump in. And to give you this example, if, if this is a, a cell, it's the smallest thing that I could draw in PowerPoint, and looking at um, um, an avian embryo like a quail here, it's way, way too large for looking at a confocal microscope or even a light sheet. So let's see a little bit about uh, these techniques. And I also want to talk about uh, an important concept, another important concept here, which is the, 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 the mean free path uh, um, during which the photons can expect it to behave in what's called the ballistic regime. In other words, if you're firing a laser and you expect photons to travel on a linear path, don't forget that light has both this, this particle and wave nature. So think of it now as a particle, if you're firing light through your objective, the laser light through your objective, it will go in a, as a straight ray. Uh, but as soon as it enters biological material and it starts colliding with, um, with sugars and then, and then lipids and then water and even gases mixed in with li liquids, it starts bending. For about 100 microns, which is a little bit more than the thickness of a human hair, you can expect most of the photons to travel fairly you know, straight. Beyond that, they immediately start scattering to a point that after a while, it's completely unpredictable where they end up. You know where you're firing your photons from, but you cannot predict exactly where they're going to end. In other words, if you obtain an image deeper into the tissue, the information that you get is all garbled. It's haziness. You can't, you can't get detailed. You can't get real, real information. With two photon, you can extend this, as I said, um, but beyond two, three, 500 microns, then it's practically impossible to get any, any sensible information out of this. Now at the IMF, they actually have an animal imager and they've noticed this as well, uh, if you've used it, that you can detect light. It's just extremely difficult to know exactly which organ it's coming from and what's the shape of the organ or actually making any measurements. There's another interesting concept here for you to be aware is that Light is not absorbed, uh, and I've already mentioned that it's not scattered the same way by all wavelengths, but it's also not absorbed uniformly by all wavelengths. So it's actually this optical window here above 650 up to about at least 900 nanometers, where light is very little absorbed by the biological material. Uh, most confocals still operate on this regime here because they use blue, green, and red light. Multiphotons operate on this regime, and that's one of the advantages of the multiphoton as well, as you see here. Now, three-dimensional imaging requires, uh, the, our paradigm is still pretty much the production of optical slices. And there's multiple ways of doing optical slicing. Zerin already mentioned this. With wide field, you don't do optical slicing. With confocal microscopy, you do optical slicing because you can actually use in the pinhole, only detect the light that comes from this plane. But there's this problem with confocal, uh, typical confocals is that you're still illuminating the parts of the embryo that you don't want to detect. So you're photo bleaching those parts of the embryo. Light sheet microscopy is a new development, fairly 15 year old development, um, which addresses this problem by instead of illuminating from the objective, from the detection side, it actually illuminates from the side perpendicular to where you're detecting the light. So you can, only, you can eliminate only the cells or the portions of the tissues that you can actually uh, interested in imaging. And then you can move your sample across this plane of light and detect different sections and that way acquire a Z stack. And there, as I said, many different ways of doing optical sectioning, but I'm, I'm only going to refer to these two. One is by using light sheet illumination and we'll see in a moment how that works. And the other one is computed tomography, which is based, it's a derivation of medical imaging with x-rays, um, which is the thing that uh, Rina was mentioning when, when he said that, that, that I worked on this optical tomography device. So light sheet microscopy, just a very quick historical perspective, uh, was invented early in the, in the last century by Zygmonski, who actually was a chemist and he was interested in looking at uh, colloidal gold molecules in suspension. He got this idea of making the light focus just in a plane. And then as colloidal particles were going through that plane of light, he had an objective on the other end and he could detect like a blink. And he was able to measure lots of 
um, properties of, of, of chemical gold in suspension this way. And for those discoveries, he was awarded a Nobel Prize. There was there, this anecdotal story that there was a patent for this technology that was lost during the decades. Um, and, and it was eventually rediscovered in the 90s. The technique was um, used by Voy and Burns to clearly demonstrate the use of a cylindrical lens. Now, a cylindrical lens is a piece of glass uh, typically, we call it a cylindrical, but it's actually a half cylinder. If you make light go through a half cylinder of glass, you will notice that on the other end, you actually have a sheet, a plain um, sheet of light. And you can, you, you can illuminate your sample sideways, which is what they've done here on this cochlea of a guinea pig. Uh, and, and you can just detect then the, 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 the piece, the, the portion of the tissue that's being traversed by this sheet of light. Now, they also realized something very important is that with a bone on the on the on the skull, and and the translucent nature of the tissue, that simply by illuminating with a sheet of light, it was not enough. The, just like the point of light on a confocal, a sheet of light also scatters, and that is, uh, it's not possible to get anything meaningful out of this. So you need to clear the tissues in order to be able to see properly. And they've 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 basically unearthed this eighty-year-old technique from Spatlitz, which I'll talk about in a moment again. Ten years later, Huisken and, and Hernd Stelzer uh, would uh, pick up on this technology again and adapt it and make a, a series of improvements that uh, allow them to actually image live embers without having to kill them and, and make them transparent. So the, the size of things is now smaller, but it's still things larger than you can typically image on a confocal microscope. And that's basically what sparked the light sheet revolution in the last at least 10 years. Um, with the uh, with, uh, observation of, uh, of organisms, full organisms inside a microscope, which were impossible to do previously with confocal or even to photo microscopy. So the advantage of using light sheet microscopy is that you have a lot less photo damage and bleaching, and you can now image things for much, much longer. You can go much faster because instead of going point by point, you can go plane by plane. So you can acquire dozens, even dozens of frames per second. Um, but it also has some disadvantages. Uh, the generating a light sheet is not as efficient as, as concentrating the light on a very tiny spot on a tampoco. So you end up having less resolution. The thickness of the sheet is typically larger than the, the thickness of that tiny spot that you can generate with tampocos and photons. And mounting the sample is unusual. It's weird. You have, typically you have to keep the sample suspended and have to have illuminated, illuminated from the side. So you have to have agarose. It, you can't just go there with your regular Petri dish. So that's normally a turn off for some people, which uh, requires more work. Light sheet technology is available in CoLive, at least in three labs um, that I know of, the IGC, the AMM, and the Champollion Foundation. Just another, um, just to emphasize, when you're using a conventional, either wide field or confocal microscope, this is what happens. You're illuminating the whole sample but you're trying to detect only light from a plane, an optical section. With light sheet microscopy, you illuminate just what you want to detect. So if there is any photo damage, it only occurs in the cells that you're illuminating. Whereas with conventional AP fluorescence illumination, everything is damaged, even though you're only detecting light uh, from one plane at a time. So this was, the uh, Lecce technology was invented in about 2004. It took a few years for the first years. It was just, you'd have to collaborate with a group that had invented it. You had to travel to Germany to image in their systems. And um, companies took quite a while. The first company was Zeiss. Zeiss owned the patent for light sheet. Uh, they acquired the patent for light sheet. It's actually said, again, this might be anecdotal, but it's said that Zeiss actually had the original patent and had forgotten about it for seven years. Um, so it was taking a while for Zeiss to come up with a, you know, this is a completely new system. Everything had to be re redesigned. It was taking Zeiss a while um, to come up with a commercial system. So five, six years down the road, several groups worldwide decided, you know, this is actually not complex to manufacture. Let's start building one. And building light sheet microscopes, your own home cooked version of light sheet microscope was actually one of the major driving forces of open source in biology and in microscopy in the last decade. It's actually quite interesting. In fact, the, 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 the group, one of the groups in Germany who developed, it was uh, collaborating the development of the light sheet, um, actually ended up developing a fully open source version of light sheet, including um, Fiji, the version of Fiji, which has been adapted for 3D imaging, was in part developed because of this need to analyze light sheet images. 
Um, and, and the IGC um, jumped on this bandwagon very early on, around 2010 and 11. Uh, Nuno and Emilio were working and started building uh, the, our version of the, of the light sheet. And in 2012, we had one of the first worldwide prototypes at the Gulbenkian Institute um, of a, an optical tomography, I'm sorry, of a light sheet microscope. Uh, it was called Open Spin Microscopy, and it was published exactly in the same issue as the more famous Open Spin um, light sheet system, which is still you know, very prevalent and found worldwide. So here's an, um, an image from Emilio who gives you a notion of how light sheet works very generally. So this is the sheet of blue light going through a sample. And now you're moving the sample and making it traverse this light sheet. And you see what happens when light hits the sample, you get fluorescence and there's a camera on this side. Imagine the viewer is the camera and you're seeing exactly what happens. You can immediately see some of the things that happen in light sheet microscopy. One is the fact that there's shadows on the other side because the laser is only pointing from this side. You can also tell that, you know, here it doesn't seem to be very sharp. Here is very sharp. Here is not sharp again. Focusing the laser on a very depth, um, you cannot make it very homogeneous using conventional optics and a, a typical Bessel beam. It, it, you have this beam waste where it's inhomogeneous. So you're not gonna get the same resolution all across the whole um, fly in this case, but you can still reconstruct it in 3D and get a very clear, fast image of what this structure looks like in three dimensions. And that's one of the great advantages of spin uh, technology. Now, there's many, many, many flavors of light sheet microscopes these days. Um, and, and, and today is, it's a jungle of different systems and there's many different commercial versions of it as well and, and different levels of samples that you can image with light sheet microscopy. Um, in the, um, in um, the Lisbon area, in the co-life um, co group of labs, we actually have a total of five light sheet microscopes if I'm not mistaken. So there's one at IMM, two at Champalimau and two at IGC. Um, one of the things that was uh, added was the fact that you can generate light sheets, not just by using cylindrical lens, but you can actually use a mirror and make the, the, the laser beam move very, very fast. And if the laser beam is moving very fast, you can generate kind of a, an almost an instantaneous plane of light just by having it fly through your sample very, very fast. You can also take advantage of these moving mirrors in another way by tilting this sheet of light so that basically the sheet of light is going through the sample like this, if my face was the sample, but you can actually make it tilt this way. And this way you, you eliminate the shadows, which is one of the problems of the light sheet. So you make the light sheet bend around whatever structures would cause a shadow and then you eliminate it. So that was one of the, the interesting developments in the recent years. And that's basically how the Zeiss operates, the Zeiss Z1 light sheet operates to eliminate the shadows in what they call the pivot mode. Another interesting uh, development is the use of two lasers, dual side elimination. And as you may have guessed, we're looking at, typically looking at the very large things. So there's still this frustration that as you move farther away, the portion of the tissue that's far away from the objective will actually be difficult to distinguish because there's still scattering of light. It's going to be very, very difficult to image through all of the tissue with the same quality. But because the way the light sheet and the sample are mounted on light sheets is completely different from a conventional microscope, the sample is actually now suspended. So you can rotate it 180 degrees and also get an image from the other side. Or you can put another camera on the other side. And that's where the concept of dual side illumination and detection comes from. Some systems have dual lasers and dual cameras. Others only have one camera. And the Zeiss Z1, which is the most common one and the one you will find mostly at um, at, at CoLife, there's only one camera, so you need to rotate your sample from, from both sides. How big a sample can you have? Well, depends on the construction of the light sheet itself. There's limits. Um, macro and meso samples, and by macro, I mean in the range of multiple millimeters to so even centimeters, are far too large for your typical Zeiss Z1, which is optimized mostly for live imaging. Um, but it is possible to do uh, things as large as one, two, three, four centimeters using, for example, um, a light sheet, macro light sheet that exists in the Champalimau Foundation, the Ultra Microscope, or our own open spin and open T at the Gulbenkian Institute. But people still rely a lot on imaging cells in petri dishes. So there have been developments for imaging with light sheet. Instead of using 
a point of light using a, a sheet of light going through a petri dish and imaging and oblique plane microscopy and dice beams are just two very common examples which i don't have a lot of time to go through today but just suffices to say that in this case you can actually use a petri dish and image inside the petri dish in some cases you image from underneath the petri dish in other cases you have to submerge the the, the, the objectives inside the petri dish but you are able to generate a light sheet image um, using with these inside the cells. But the biggest problem that, that you have with the most configurations of light sheets for imaging inside dishes is that you're looking at cells, you typically want high resolution and generating a light sheet that is consistent across the field of view and that is very narrow, it's extremely difficult. And that problem was overcome by the introduction, the introduction of lattice light sheets, which I believe we mentioned already this morning and, and David already gave some, some um, ideas of how it operates. With lattice light sheets, you can actually generate by using an interference pattern, a much thinner sheet of light. Um, you, you actually project this pattern across your sample that you then need to wiggle for it to generate this, this, this uh, plane effect. And then you can sweep it across your sample. And very recently, Zeiss has uh, just released a version of this that allows you to do this actually from underneath the Petri dish, creating this microscope where you can just drop your Petri dish and do imaging. What is the advantage of do, doing uh, lattice light sheet? Well, it's much less phototoxic than your conventional confocal microscope, even your spinning disk confocal microscope, because it's only illuminating the part that you're actually detecting. Um, and you get nearly isometric resolution, and that's something very important. Isometric resolution is your ability to see detail no matter which angle you can uh, uh, look from. So with lattice light sheets, you're typically getting resolutions close to the diffraction limit, almost in all the three uh, dimensions, which is a, a great improvement and certainly going to, um, to change the way we see things and we image live uh, cells in petri dishes, which is still, as I said, the most convenient method. There's another concept in, important about imaging with light sheets. Now, if you're, if you're illuminating from this side, and you're detecting from this side, it is expected that light will start scattering and be absorbed. So this side of the image that you're detecting, it's gonna be a little bit shadowed. It's not gonna look so good. You can have another laser, and then in this case, both of the sides, that's the, as I said, the, 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 the advantage of dual side illumination, both sides will be illuminated. And as long as the two lasers travel to your sample and don't scatter too much, you'll be fine. But what happens is that both sides of the sample might not be exactly similar in terms of their optical properties. So this light sheet will bend a little bit and scatter. This one will bend in a different way. And when they meet in the end, there's a mixture of two different light sheets. And this is a big challenge for some of these microscopes. So you improve some things, but you then create other problems. But the side that's away from the detecting objective, it's still very bad. You, you don't get much information out, or usable information out of this. If you put another camera, then you can see this side as well. But you get the notion that at, at this point, you're not just getting one image of your sample as you would normally do on a confocal microscope. You're likely to get, be getting four different Z stacks of your sample, looking from different angles and with different illuminations. And it becomes a mess. Now, if you don't want to make your light sheet microscope too complicated, you can still just use one illumination and one detection, and you just rotate your sample and you collect images from different quadrants. And once again, you have different stacks that you then have to assemble and put together. These need to be registered in 3D space and put together. And this process is called multi-view reconstruction. That's very much the way Z, Zeiss Z1 and most of the light sheets operate. Is, is you have to be aware of this notion that you're going to generate tons of data, and then you have to have a lot of time to process this data before you can actually get your final product of a beautiful 3D stack or a very large sample. So what if you want to do things even larger than what you do on your conventional light sheet microscopes, like a whole chicken um, after it was born or something like that? This is far too large for any light sheet microscope. Well, you can take advantage of uh, technology similar to what's used in X-ray uh, medical imaging. But instead of using X-rays, you can use light. We just need to make the tissues transparent. And this the art of making tissues transparent is by no means new. Tissue clearing is, is more than 100 years old. But it, it keeps being rediscovered when people get excited about, um, about these things. And very recently, uh, people have been developing lots of techniques for clearing tissues. Um, you're basically, what you're, when you're doing this, you're basically removing 
the homogeneity of refractive index inside your samples. You're removing the, the sugars, you're removing the salts, you're removing the minerals, you're removing the water. And in the end, it's practically just protein. You do a series of chemical treatments. And as I said, protein, when it's purified, it has the same refractive index as glass. So if you replace now the water with an oil that also has a high refractive index close to glass, then you're going to have protein, oil, and the glass that contains your sample, and everything will be at a very close refractive index, like vitrified. This is what tissue clearing is in its most simple form. It's um, creating an homogeneous optical medium with a refractive index close to glass, and then light can go through it with much less scattering. Things become, instead of translucent, they become transparent. And there are many protocols to do this. And many of these protocols are just paths of frustration because uh, there's many little steps. And for some reason, sometimes it works better than others. And as far as I know, the Shinpolymo has also been working and optimizing some of these protocols and testing. We have begun recently testing a lot of these protocols as well. Donald working in our lab has been doing that. And there is no simple solution that will work all the time. So this is one of the things that you, I invite you to talk to the people in your lab or any of us and your imaging facilities to try to come up with a, a good solution for you. Just know that this is not the kind of thing that you can do next week. It typically requires months of testing and optimizing things until you get it to work in your sample. Also be aware that if you're interested, that most of the clearing protocols are not compatible with GFP. GFP will not fluoresce once you make the chemical treatments. So you have to somehow um, stain or even detect the GFP using immunostaining. And getting antibodies to go through millimeters of tissue can take weeks or months. So it's, it's, it's something that requires time, but it's something that I definitely um, advise everyone to do, even for conventional confocal microscopy, you should clear your tissues um, because it makes a huge, huge difference. Sometimes it's, it's, it, it's the reason why you don't longer leave the two photon or a light sheet microscope, for example, you can do it in your confocal. It's just by clearing your tissue and it might be enough. Now, if, if I still have a few minutes, how am I doing your time today? Yeah, you, 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 you can continue. We can go on for a few minutes. Okay, so the optical tomography is a completely different approach to doing three-dimensional imaging. You actually image the whole sample, like in this case is a mouse embryo. You image through it, but you make it rotate in space and you acquire hundreds to thousands of images from different angles. And then very much like on a medical CT scanner, you can computationally calculate where the light is coming in three dimensions from each one of these points. And you can go line by line across this movie and you can reconstruct it in three dimensions. Um, it's actually very easy, even much easier than building a light sheet to build one of these systems. You just need a source of light, a camera, something to hold your sample and a motor to rotate it. And this is, this is one of my pet projects a few years ago. And it turns out that it's so inexpensive to build one of these and, and, and the quality of images is so good that um, we actually ended up making a lot of success with it and a lot of fun with this. The, the recent thing we've done is actually build one in, with Legos, which I don't have time to show today. But Lashandra has built a whole version with Legos, which you can build for less than 500 euros. And what kind of quality of images do you, so this is what it looks like. And in some cases you actually, don't even use a microscope objective. You use a mag an objective that demagnifies because what you're trying to look at an image is actually larger than the chip inside your camera. So you have to reduce, but the quality of the objectives is still good enough that you can get one, two, four, nine megapixels in this case uh, that we're working with to get enough information um, about your sample that you can reconstruct it in three, in three dimensions with re really high quality. You can do fluorescence. One of the advantages of optical tomography is you can actually do transmitted light as well. So you can actually just use a regular red light, shine through the sample as if it was x-rays, and you can see inside it, as long as it's transparent enough, you can see inside it and reconstruct it in 3D. And this is the kind of images you get out of that, very much like you know, a micro MRI or a micro CT scanner. But instead of costing millions of euros, it costs you thousands or hundreds of euros to build one of these machines. And you can acquire images very, very fast. On a light sheet microscope, you, you still have to flip the sample from the other side because on an OPT, you get images from all the angles. The quality is really asymmetric. You always get the same quality from any angle. So you don't have to do multi-view reconstruction. 
the reconstruction itself is a multi view reconstruction process. And we, today it's actually quite fast. It's faster to do optical tomography than it actually is to do light sheet microscopy uh, on, on very large samples like this. And, and we've been improving it. Olshanda has recently done very, very large things. It's actually done a while ago, but Olshanda has just improved this. We're doing things on the four or five centimeter scale with really high resolution as this example here. So this is the previous embryo. This is much larger now and, and we're still getting a lot of detail and information out of, out of this. And our, the latest development is actually to build a setup that does both light sheets and optical tomography on the same um, microscope. So you can put your sample and get an image of both. And this is what I meant by asymmetric. No matter what angle you're looking at, you always get the exact same resolution, which is, you know, even for light sheet microscopy, this is not always really achievable, not attainable. And, and I'm just gonna stop it there. This is what I had to tell you about large scale imaging. I hope it wasn't too confusing. And if there's still a couple of moments, I can ask, I can answer some questions. Sure, thank you very much, Gabi, fantastic talk. Um, any questions for Gabi? We I see we have one, so, um, so um, Dinesh raised the hand. Uh, Lino Morgado asked the question here. Thank you for the talk, Gabi, it was great. Is there any reason why specifically GFP fluorescence doesn't survive many of the clearing protocols? This is from Lino Morgado. Actually, it's not specific of GFP. Most fluorescent proteins will not survive. They're, they need to be in a physiological environment in order to emit fluorescence. There's, there's still some bizarre reasons why people are not 100% sure why they don't emit fluorescence at all once you go to high refractive indexes. In many cases, it's a matter of quenching. The fluorescence is still there, but the chemical and more you change completely and it, it, it can no longer emit fluorescence. If you go back and rehydrate the samples, for example, they will still emit. Now, having said this, there are some clearing protocols the hydration protocols that don't completely dehydrate the sample and you can still see GFP. The problem with, with most of these protocols is that you cannot get such an effective clearing as you get with the protocols that require dehydration and that are more harsh for fluorescent proteins. But it's not just GFP, it's most fluorescent proteins will not emit fluorescence once, you're, once you clear the tissues. Having said this, most chemical dyes as long as they're not lipophilic, most chemical dyes like Sci-5 and Fizzi and these things and Alexis will uh, survive the, the clearing protocol. So if you do an immuno anti-GFP, you, yeah. yeah. you can still image. Yeah, the first and proteins tend to lose their confirmation. So they're still there. You can detect them with antibodies, but you know, in case of GSP, GFP, the beta barrier is not formed. You don't have a chromophore, so it, it, doesn't, it will not fluoresce. rest. Um, again, Transfil is asking Aslidan um, Gapi, any guess on what the tissue limited resolution is from the clearing protocols? Okay, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Uh, any guess what the tissue limited resolution is from the clearing protocols? Well, if, if the tissue is perfectly clear, that doesn't affect your resolution. What affects you and dictates your resolution, if you recall, is the wavelength of light, the refractive index, and the numerical aperture of your optical system. That's ultimately what defines your, your resolution. Having said that, if the quality of your, of, uh, if the scattering of light occurs um, and the light starts spreading all over the place deeper inside the tissue, then you know, you have a really good theoretical resolution, but you can't achieve it because you can't focus the light and keep it focused. So, but again, the, if you have a high numerical aperture uh, objective and you're doing light sheet with a high numerical aperture objective, you're, you're going to get the resolution that you get from that objective. But you have to remember that in light sheet microscopy, you're not using the, the detection objective to, to, to illuminate the sample. You're using another objective to illuminate the sample. And typically the illumination objectives have lower numerical aperture. There's several reasons for it. Uh, probably one of the reasons is because the higher the numerical aperture, the more the point spread function suffers from spherical aberration when you, when you have differences of refractive index. So using low numerical apertures allows the light sheet to penetrate deeper with less scattering. However, the resolution is compromised. Uh, and, and I guess the answer to your question is that there's a compromise. 
And that's in part the reason why you have so many different configurations of light sheets is because you're optimizing for different circumstances and different samples and different uh, things. For example, at Champalimau, they have two different light sheets. One is optimized just for imaging large things with low resolution, and you can go millimeters and even more than a centimeter in depth. But they also have the same light sheet that we have and that EMM has optimized for live imaging where you cannot image more than a millimeter. And even a millimeter is already a challenge. Half of it is it's bad, you need to rotate the sample, but you can get higher resolution and do live imaging. Okay, um, question from Ines Mollet. From, she also asked yesterday, we saved this one for you. She's asking if we clear sample for light sheets, how can we check that it is adequately cleared before taking the sample to a light sheet? So how can you tell when the sample is cleared? If, if you've done your job right, there's a moment at which you're gonna get really scared. You look at your tube, you we often do this clear, and you can't find it and then you think you've lost it. And you're, you're in panic, that's the sign you've done a good job. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you, if, you, if you have a sample, even on a slide, and you look at it, and you can see it with your eyes, and you take it to the confocal microscope, you're going to have problems if it's something deep. <laughs> so, so when you do it right, you lose your sample. You don't see. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, Luis Marx, great talk as always. Gabi, any opinions on the recent Snalpy type single objective? Yeah, I, I didn't have time to, to go into the oblique plane microscopy. Exactly, the, uh, oblique plane. Uh, yeah, by the way, um, the Champali Mo, as far as I know, the group of Michael York has been working a lot of this. They've actually implemented at least one OPM at Champali Mo. I don't, I don't think these are open for the public, but at least it's there if you're uh, interested in. The Snouty is a, it's a new type of objective that you can use if you want to build a light sheet that operates just with one objective. Well, it's really not just one objective, but it, it, it's, it's one objective you can image with, you can make the light sheet go through it. Um, I don't believe we talked about turf imaging. But there's a way that you can shine a laser through the back aperture of your objective and it comes out on the other end of the sample end and you generate this oblique light sheet through it. You can, you, you can create that effect um, on a regular inverted microscope. And, and this generates an image, a virtual image of your sample in the back of the, inside the microscope. That is at a, at a tilted angle, which isn't really very useful. You can't do much with that image, but you can actually create another inverted microscope inside your microscope that will image that virtual image of your sample and project it in the camera. And the snouty lens is a, is a specific lens that has a glass, front glass cut away that you can bring very, very close to your sample and generate that effect. It's, I, I'm not giving it a very good explanation, but in other words, it's a special development of objective that allows you to do light sheet high resolution imaging on a conventional microscope on a Petri dish. Okay, it's one of the multiple attempts to image Petri dishes and even, you know, glass, um, glass bottom 96 well plates for doing high content screenings with light sheets and all of this. There's still a lot of development being done in light sheet microscopy. We're far from seeing the end of the story. Um, and, and you will most likely see in a few years light sheets replacing confocal microscopes. And I mean, the story is in, for some of us, is that the reason why it took so long for light sheets to come out is because they were afraid of, of killing the, the confocal business. It's a technology killer, like they say. You know? Most people would dodge buying new confocals knowing that the new light sheet is coming out and they would prefer the light sheet. And we've heard people here today mentioning that, that they're, you know, potential candidates for buying a lattice light sheet, you know. <laughs> so if you've seen this, you're not gonna buy a confocal in the near future. We all have very high expectations for the lattice light sheet. <laughs> all right, just, um, so Erin Trentfield and Dinesh raise the hand. Erin, um, you wanna ask um, something to Gabi? Let me unmute you, or maybe you unmute your I can find it. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Okay. And I guess I don't have a camera. Um, I just wanted to push back a bit on you, Gabby. So my question was really about, you know, in these ultra high resolution techniques where you're really pushing the capabilities of your imaging, but at the same time you're doing tissue clearing where you're ultimately stripping everything but the proteins out of your sample. How far is it worth going in your imaging like, when is your sample limiting the, the value of going higher? 
Good question. I mean, you're an EM person, so you, you know what happens to, to organelles and cells when you don't fix them right, when you treat them with harsh chemicals. Most of the times, the effects that you see are at the subcellular level, and you don't really attain subcellular resolution where you're doing clearing. That's not what you're interested in. You're interested in, in large-scale imaging. The, the other thing is that you, you actually do see effects. For example, um, if you look carefully at the movies that I was playing on that mouse, you may notice that the brain seems to be shrunken. Some tissues shrink more than others. Okay, And that used to worry worry me a lot until techniques like expansion microscopy started coming along and people demonstrating that it's actually possible to blow things up four and 10 times and the three-dimensional relationship between things is still kept there. So it, sometimes you have to take this with a grain of salt. For example, if you're going to make measurements, be aware that dehydrating shrinks things 10, 15, sometimes more than 20%. As long as you do it slowly, for example, it tends to be homogeneous. If it's not homogeneous, you will notice that the tissue is really seriously distorted and it has kinks and wrinkles and all of this. So there's some tricks to how you do the chemical treatment, but it, it, it is true. It affects um, some things, some, some of the, sometimes the three-dimensional architecture of the tissues. And you have to be careful about that. The, the hydration clearing protocols like clarity and these things actually swell things up. They blow them up two, three times. So if there were empty spaces inside tissues, now there are no longer empty spaces. That's also a problem. All right, um, Dinesh, you wanna yes. ask Gabi a question? Yes, not. Are you there? Hello. 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 Ah, go ahead. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, ni very nice presentation. Uh, uh, may I ask you one question? I have one query. Can we image soft fields of hippocampus using two photon? Why and why not? Two photon is actually used very, very often to image through the brain tissue. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there. Some people have demonstrated imaging as deep as one, two, two is, is pushing it a bit, but at least one millimeter. Uh, through brain tissue. I have to confess with our system, we were never able to image more than just a few hundred um, microns on fresh tissue. Now with clear, mm -hmm. if, you, if you remove the piece of brain and you clear it, uh, some people have imaged as deep as six, seven or more millimeters of brain tissue. Cleared. Well, uh, okay. Clear, and in clear. fact, cleared. And there's some objectives now which allow you to go deep as deep as that, as eight millimeters working this. Is it in, in vivo or? No, not in vivo. We... No, not in vivo. In vivo, uh, the best uh. you can do is probably a few hundred, uh, maybe in some cases. I've heard about so, one millimeter, so, but I've never so been able to. Is it, uh, is it uh, uh, can we go up to 600, uh, 600 ml? It, uh, but Possibly, yes. I'm not going to say you're going to be able to get it every time. Now, be aware that you still need to open the skull and, and, uh -huh. yeah. and, so, and so remove we... the bone, remove the bone. Yes. What people do is, for example, in mice, is you, you open an optical window where you basically scrape the bone and then yeah. you put yeah. glass and you glue the glass to the remainder of the mm -hmm. bone and then you can image through the rat. And, and the, the mice and the rat will live just fine for a few days with that. People actually have put them in the microscope. I, I believe they've done this at Vision Poly uh, They've done this routinely. And then they take them back and come the next day and image again, and then take them back and come the next day and image again. And even find the same cells, which is quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Gabi, thank you very much. Let's give, so let's much. give you a break, particularly because you're so under the weather. <laughs> really, thank you. Thanks a lot <laughs> for this fantastic well. talk. I couldn't miss um, this. Not even so the corona was going to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> well then, Gary. Um, all right, you guys. So thanks a lot, um, everybody. We'll be receiving, I think, after the, the this lectures, uh, a short uh, a survey from, from all of us. We want to hear from you how you like the course, suggestions. Um, please um, um, reply to that. And um, I don't know, Maria, do you want to? Yeah, wanna so once the this? one. Once the webinar finishes, we will be redirected to, to this survey uh, Rino was talking about. Uh, please, uh, please reply and give us your suggestions.
on uh, on the format and on the contents of uh, of the workshop. And thank you so much for staying with us until so late. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, please contact uh, one of them uh, with any questions you have. Hope right. You've enjoyed it. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. bye thank guys. you.